Good morning, and welcome to the launch of the Africa.com Women Heads of State Initiative. We are especially pleased today to welcome the many heads of state and heads of government who are joining us today on Zoom, as well as acknowledge the four heads of state who will be speaking with us today, and that is Madam Joyce Banda of Malawi, Madam President Amina Gurib Fakim of Mauritius, Madam President Ellen Sirleaf Johnson of Liberia, and the Honorable Sarah Kukongelwa Amadila of Namibia. In addition, we have several women heads of state in our audience today, including Madam President Samba Panza of the Central African Republic. Merci d'être avec nous aujourd'hui, Madame Présidente. I must also thank our sponsor for today, Coca-Cola Africa, especially Patricia Obuzua, Emily Weta, Benchik El Hussein, and Jesse Loshihura, the team with whom we have worked to develop this event for today. Coca-Cola, thank you very much for making this possible. This is the launch of the Africa.com Women Heads of State Initiative, something about which I have a tremendous amount of passion and just couldn't be any more excited to be a part of and to dedicate much, much time and energy and love. This is around acknowledging the women who have served as head of state and head of government in Africa. This is a group of women, some of whose name you know, but many of them you don't know. And that's what's so exciting about this. I've been asking everyone that I've come across for the last many months, how many women do you think have served as head of state in Africa, defined as president or prime minister? And the general consensus of some pretty fair, uh, sophisticated people about Africa is somewhere between three and five. Well, we did our research at Africa.com and we found that the number since independence is much bigger than that. I guess I'm gonna give something away that you'll see in the film that we're going to show you later in this session. But the total number is 22. 22 women have served as head of state or head of government since 1970. Now, many of these women came into power after the president was uh, passed away or was removed from office. But nonetheless, there have been 22 women who sat in that seat of power. And we think that that is a very important collective group of women to bring together. And that's what this initiative does. The initiative has several components. The first of which is simply to identify these women. No one has identified this collective group of 22 in the past. So we have published and are releasing today the list of the 22. That in and of itself is something. But beyond that, we are here today to acknowledge them, to introduce them to you as part of this summit. And we have, as I've mentioned, four of them speaking today. Beyond that, we are also doing what we call legacy interviews, making sure that the history of these women is properly documented. We're doing detailed biographical interviews with them. These interviews are on video. We will also strip out the sound and they will be available on podcast in addition to video. And they're being transcribed and donated to the major universities in their countries and throughout the continent. In addition to that, we are training. We want to help train the next generation of leaders. We are focused on women in public service, in civil service, and on April 28th, we will be leading a session for women who are in the first five years of their career. We think this is the right place for us. There are many leadership initiatives, as we all know, but none focused on women at the early stages of their careers in government. And that's what we are doing. So we're looking forward to that. If you know any women, who are in the first five years of their, um, of their career, we ask you to invite them to join us. We have fantastic faculty from Oxford University and Harvard University who are organizing that program with us. It is free to any woman in the first five years of her government service career on April 28th. You can register on africa.com starting next week. Today, as always, we like to tell you who is in the audience. We have people from 62 countries, 34 countries on the continent, and 28 countries around the rest of the world. We have over 2,500 registrants for us for this event, joining us today on Zoom and on Facebook. Hello to all of our friends on Facebook. We have several women, as I mentioned, from the definitive list of women heads of state, but we also have various CEOs from the Africa.com definitive list of women CEOs. Um, about 38% of our audience today is male. 
Over half have very senior corporate titles. And today in particular, we've done outreach, given our topic to the government sector. And we have 449 people registered from government with senior titles such as Director General, Deputy Director General, Secretary General, Under Secretary, Regional Director, Executive Secretary, etc. We also have a fair number of people in the Foreign Service, especially from South Africa. We welcome all of you um, who are here from around the world representing your country and the continent to the globe. The format for today, we hope you enjoy. Um, it is basically structured into four parts. The first part is six opportunities for Africa's advancement. We work together with our partners on this to think of six topics that are essential to Africa's advancement at this moment in time. And we came up with six themes and then asked ourselves, who are the six people we would want to speak on these themes? And we have been so privileged because our very first choices for all six accepted our invitations. It's also interesting to see how much we're getting back to work these days, because I think almost all of our speakers seem to be traveling and everyone is traveling. I know what all the major conferences are across the continent right now, because it seems as if our speakers today are speaking at them. And so many of our speakers are stepping outside of other commitments to be with us. We thank you for that commitment. Then we will have an address by the president of Coca-Cola, Bruno Pietracci. And then we will have the introduction of the women heads of state. Our team has produced a fantastic short film to introduce you to the 22 women who have served as head of state. And then lastly, of course, we have the speeches by the heads of state themselves, the four heads of state, Joyce Banda, Sarah Kugongela, Amadila, Amina Garib-Fakim, and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf will share their remarks with us. Lastly, I will just share with you that coming forward after this, we have something else very exciting in the weeks ahead, what we hope you will come back and join us for. And that will be an unscripted, unprecedented conversation between two of these women heads of state. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and Amina Garib Fakim are going to be on camera with no journalists talking as two women heads of state to one another share in their private conversation about what it's been like to be a woman head of state. So we hope that you are looking forward to all of those activities as we are. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the moderator for the first session, the six, up, six short talks on big opportunities. We are especially privileged today to have Professor Ruth Okadiji from Harvard Law School. Ruth is a professor who needs very little introduction. She has been on our platform before as an expert when we did a session on law across Africa. She is the Jeremiah Smith Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and co-director of the Berkman Klein Center. She is a renowned scholar in intellectual property law. I happen to know that she is advising some African countries on their, on their frameworks around intellectual property law right now. I don't know if she will mention that, but it's very exciting to see how engaged she is. Of course, we know that she hails from Nigeria and is a very proud graduate of the University of Joss. And I know that we have people registered from the University of Joss on with us today, go University of Joss, and graduate of Harvard Law School. Uh, Professor Okadeji, I'm going to turn this over to your very able hands and thank you again for agreeing to moderate this first panel of luminaries from across the continent as they give us their short talks on big opportunities. Thank you so much, Teresa, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone in the audience and on Facebook watching us live. It is my pleasure to moderate this panel on short talks on big opportunities for Africa. When Teresa and I began talking about this event some months ago, I was one of the folks that she asked, well, how many women heads of state have there been since independence swept the continent? And I too, did not know what you will learn today. So it is really an honor to have this unprecedented meeting and event um, to hear about the future of our continent and to know the role that women heads of state have played and will continue to play. Our first speaker this morning is going to be, morning my time at least, is going to be Wanjira Matai. She is the vice president and regional director of Africa of the World Resources Institute. Wanjira is uh, well known uh, in, in circles really all over the world. She formerly served as co-chair 
of the uh, WRI's Global Restoration Council, and she was a senior advisor there. She is an inspiring leader. Um, and Wanjira, I think, is perhaps well known um, really for much of her mother's legacy, which she carries with astonishing dignity. Um, her mother, of course, um, was the Nobel Prize laureate um, in 2004, um, the Green Belt Movement, which her mother began, um, and for which the Nobel uh, Prize recognized her, uh, remains a distinguished mantle that Wanjira carries and carries with great honor and respect. And so Wanjira, we will hear your first talk on big opportunities for Africa's development and advancement. Wanjira. Ruth, thank you very much. <clears throat> what a privilege to be in, in this company and certainly uh, the acknowledgement of the excellencies, uh, women excellencies uh, makes us all so proud. So what a, what a wonderful gathering, thank you. And thank you for having the World Resources Institute here as well. Um, I'm gonna be speaking about uh, a, a really important topic, water. Water, uh, as many people know, we cannot live without water, can we? But this might surprise some people in absolute terms. Water is actually not in short supply around the planet, but the total usable freshwater supply for ecosystems and humans is actually less than 1% of all fresh water resources. It just shows you just how precious, precious the water resources we have are and just how in this century, we have got to be even more careful because we're using water twice as fast as the population is growing. That just gives you a sense of this issue of water insecurity that I was asked <clears throat> to reflect upon. On our continent, on the African continent, <clears throat> the situation is actually quite desperate. It's estimated that around 75 to 250 million of us will lack access to fresh water by 2025. The question is really why? What is actually driving this water insecurity? The first of these is, is obvious to many. Africa is growing, its urbanization is faster than anywhere else in the world. 50 to 80% of urban populations in the African continent simply don't have access to safe drinking water or water for sanitation. And one of the main reasons is just the growing settlements, growing quickly and informally ahead of any service and infrastructure provision. Then of course, there's the good old state of water management in our cities. We've got to have African cities have a patchwork of formal and informal water and sanitation services. And those services are the ones, either boreholes, water vendors, pit latrines that are serving uh, this growing population, usually, low income residents. Then there's the good old fashioned demand for water that is projected to grow by 300 times in the next 10 years. And so this again, put quite a bit of pressure, but the one that it actually stands out the most, climate change. A recent World Bank and the most recent IPCC report indicates climate change will change everything about what we know and understand about water. Droughts, floods, will triple, storms will triple, will be either too much water or too little water. And this is the situation we find ourselves. And therefore, I have a simple message. We have to work with our states and cities to strengthen water resilience in cities and protect watershed areas upstream. Although there's a lot of political legatory powers, local governments across the continent, a lot of what's going on around devolution into smaller um, cities and governance centers drives resilience and is extremely promising. So we've got to work in those supportive, collaborative, regional cross-sectoral ways to bring about um, water security. There's one model that really inspires me. The Nature Conservancy started the Water Fund. And the Water Fund is interesting because it's a finance mechanism that brings stakeholders together to pool water investments. I love how it works. The fund brings together downstream users like businesses and cities together with upstream conservation efforts. So results in less downstream damage and the Water Fund 
is paid for by those who are using it. This is happening already in Nairobi, in Cape Town, and in Freetown, and it's always so good to see the mayor of Freetown because that those early successes are showing us that we can improve the quality and quantity of water that serves our cities. So we have to create a more secure, water secure world. And that will necessitate that we protect urban forests, every green space. We know now after COVID just how precious our green spaces in cities are. That's where we rush to when we had been confined in our homes. In Kenya today, Karura Forest, the most visited recreational space in the city. We need to protect near forests and those farther away. I wanna close excellencies by just sharing that in the final analysis, water security for the future will depend on the integrity and sustainable use of nature. We have to do four things. We have to produce, protect, reduce, and restore. This is an all of society paradigm. We need to do more sensible production of food because agriculture is pushing into most precious forests and watershed areas. Then we have to protect the remaining forests we have. This fact always amazes me. There are three major lungs of this planet, forest systems that sustain life as we know it, the Amazon, the forests of Southeast Asia and the Congo. The mighty Congo remains the healthiest lung on the planet. Let's keep it that way. And we can only do that when we have permanent protection for Africa's forests. That should be non-negotiable. Then we need to reduce the demand on agricultural land, how we produce food, and also managing the loss and the food loss and waste. And then finally, restoring forests. Today, Africa has the largest restoration potential in the world. 750 million hectares and thank goodness for the leadership across the board we have AFR 100 an African-led African-endorsed head of state rallying behind AFR 100 to restore 100 million hectares of land by 2030 that's what it will take so ladies and gentlemen excellencies let's produce protect reduce and restore to ensure Africa's water security. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wanjira, for reminding us about the value of our land and the importance of Africa in the ecosystem of the world's health, which is something that I know that I did not hear enough of uh, growing up um, in Nigeria. And I think that this is true for so many of our current generation. There's one question for you. We actually have many questions for you, but because we are limited in time, I'm going to keep it to one. Um, and this is from Agnes in Cape Town. You actually referenced this um, in your remarks. Does water rationing like we had in Cape Town a few years ago make a meaningful difference for a water secure future? Um, does water rationing make a meaningful difference for a water secure future? Well, thank you for that question, particularly from Cape Town. They faced day zero uh, with respect to water. It does, it does make a difference as an emergency measure, but it's not sustainable. You cannot ration water all the time forever. So it is an intermediary uh, quick measure as we try and put in place the necessary uh, measures that will have more long-term protection, how we use water, how we restore degraded ecosystems, and how we ensure that there's a clear understanding of that connection between where the water comes from and where it's used. There is no excuse. We have got to protect the water sources because that is where our water comes from. Thank you so much. Um, this is brought home, I think, the importance of the collaboration um, that our leadership is doing across the continent and your leadership um, on this issue. This is, in fact, an opportune time for Africa. We are grateful to you um, for your work. And I'm going to ask you one thing before I let you sign off. The other question that we will not have time to get to was about the legacy of your mother the first African woman to earn a Nobel Prize. And I'm gonna ask you to describe your mother, pick one word that you would leave with us 
in honor of your mother's legacy, but that you think of as her daughter who carries that legacy, what's one word that you would use to describe her? Wow, there are many words, but I would pick the word persistence. We've got to commit to this continent we love so much with persistence. That's what it will take. Thank you so much. We are so grateful and honored that you, Thank you. launched us in this panel this morning. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move to our next speaker uh, who needs no introduction to many of us. It is no mistake that we began our first panel with Wanjira Mathai this morning, um, who is a woman of indomitable force and, and charging the way on water and the need for the continent to preserve and maintain um, the care of, of our water supply. And that is of course related to food. Um, you know, you cannot eat without water and frankly, you need uh, water to uh, sustain the land that produces our food. Our next speaker is Dr. Adeshina. Now, I know that because this is a convening to celebrate women's leadership, I'm going to honor Dr. Adeshina's wife, who is the backbone and strength, um, the neck who turns the wisdom with which he operates. So uh, we are going to honor her um, this morning. I believe her name is Grace, and she is a woman of grace indeed. Um, so let me introduce uh, Dr. Adeshina. As I said, he does not need much introduction. Um, Dr. Adeshina is the president of the African Development Bank. Uh, he uh, was described to me as Nigeria's rock star and uh, former minister of agriculture who uh, brought innovation, something near and dear to my heart, um, who brought innovation to Nigeria's agricultural scene by introducing digital technology to small farmers and attracting billions of dollars in private investment into Nigeria's agricultural sector. Um, Dr. Adeshina, as I said, is the eighth president of the African Development Bank. He is the first Nigerian to hold the post, um, and he has championed agricultural investments in um, really the continent at large and in its fastest growing economies. His work is so tightly connected to what Wanjira has also encouraged us to do. He is a consummate scholar of African agriculture and economics. Uh, he has more than 20 years of, experiencing, of experience managing um, successful agricultural programs across Africa. It is an honor, a great delight, and with much grace to grace that we thank you, Dr. Adeshina, for leading our second talk this morning on big opportunities for Africa's advancement. Oh, thank you very much, uh, my dear sister, uh, Professor Ruth Okereji. And and thanks for that very warm introduction. If you, if you call me a rock star, then I, I have to call you Nigeria's academic uh, jewel. And thank you for your brilliance and all that you do for us globally. And thanks for your kind words about my wife, Grace, and she, I wouldn't be here without her. I always said that. Thank you so much for having me. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. I am delighted to have been invited by Teresa Clark of Africa.com to speak to you today on this special event put together by African Women Heads of State Initiative. Present right here today are some of the most inspiring leaders on the African continent. They are not just amazing women leaders, they are amazing leaders, period. We need more women to lead our world. If women had been in charge, we will not be having wars in the world today, including in Africa. While men's egos have caused wars, women's tenderness helps to foster peace. None exemplifies that better than former president of Liberia, Her Excellency Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, a Nobel Peace Prize laureate who helped to bring peace to a war-torn Liberia. Thank you very much, Mama Peace, as I call you. The leadership and accomplishments of all the women leaders presidents and prime ministers present here today that you will be celebrating is a testament to their boldness, doggedness, and resilience. In several economies outside of our continent, women are breaking glass ceilings. In Africa, given the very high levels of bias and opposition 
that women face, they are having to break concrete ceilings, not a, a glass ceilings. I'm so proud of you all, and we celebrate you. Nowhere are the challenges facing women more serious than in agriculture. While women form the bulk of the farming population, feeding families and nourishing children, their contributions are undervalued and they do not control resources. Women often lack access to and control of land, modern technologies, and many rely on traditional tools for backbreaking work. Most cook with firewood and charcoal and are biased against by farm extension programs that are dominated by men. Now, I recall as a young economist in the 90s, 1990s, at the West Africa Rice Development Association in Boaké, Côte d'Ivoire, I conducted a piece of research to determine whether actually men farmers were more efficient in rice production than women farmers, because that's what everybody always said. Our results showed very clearly that women were technically and economically as efficient as men, or even better than men farmers. So the bias of extension systems in Africa against women had no basis. I determined from that day on that if I ever was in a position of authority, I would strongly support women, especially women farmers. Well, that opportunity came in 2011 when I became the Minister of Agriculture for Nigeria to ensure that women farmers got subsidized seeds and fertilizers. I changed the old system in the government where farm inputs were supplied by the government through male-dominated extension systems. I registered 15 million farmers on a digital electronic platform using mobile phones and transmitted electronic coupons for subsidized farm inputs directly to them. This had immediate transformative impact for women who represented 50% of the farmers. While on a field trip one day, several women farmers met me and said, thank you, minister. We now get access to our own seeds and fertilizers via our mobile phones. And they added, the men can no longer cheat us. I was elated. A concrete ceiling broken for women farmers by the power of technology, mobile phones. Now, one of the women, her name is uh, Haji Aladi Baladi, expanded our rice farm from one to two hectares and made enough money to take care of 23 orphans. Amazing. Yet, women lack access to finance. There exists a $42 billion finance gap for women entrepreneurs in Africa. And of these, almost $16 billion is in the agriculture sector alone. To break this concrete ceiling, I led the African Development Bank to launch what's called the Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa, or AFAWA with the goal of providing $5 billion of financing for women-led businesses, including smallholder female farmers. A revolution is building. The African Development Bank disbursed $450 million in 2021 to financial institutions to lend to women-led businesses. This year, the bank will disburse $500 million to financial institutions to lend to women-led businesses. AFAWA is already changing the agricultural landscape. AFAWA has disbursed nearly $79 million to 210 women-owned small and medium-sized enterprises, close to $94 million to 50,000 women-owned micro-enterprises, and $50 million in financing for more than 180,000 women farmers. With access to financing, women-led businesses in agriculture are making big impacts on women farmers. Take the case of Ghana, a new game-changing $20 million financing climate resilient agricultural practices project will benefit 400 women-led micro, small and medium-sized enterprises. And this will translate to a positive impact for more than 373,000 people. The bank's support includes technical assistance, climate resilient agricultural practices, capacity building, and the diversification of agricultural crops. In 2015, Manka Angwafo from Cameroon set up her company called Grassland Cameroon. And last year, 
Manka was able to obtain $55,000 of collateral free loans supported by AFAWA's Africa Guarantee Fund. Today, Grassland Cameroon offers financing to farmers who pay in grain. This way, the company improves the quality of lives of farmers, their families, and the community at large. Aside from finance, new technologies are creating huge opportunities for women farmers. We are bringing new technologies to African farmers at scale, enabling them to increase yields and improve their livelihoods. A major centerpiece of our Feed Africa strategy at the bank is our flagship program called Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation, or TAAT, which was specifically designed to be gender sensitive. We've provided heat tolerant wheat seed, drought resistant maize varieties, and other agri technologies to more than 5.7 million women farmers across 29 African countries. Just listen to Doreen Atemo, a farmer from Kenya. She said, I used to wonder if I will ever earn enough to be independent, to own my own home. But when I joined the TART project, I was able to build my house from selling maize. But distinguished ladies and gentlemen, women must go beyond primary farm production. They must also dominate agro-processing value chains where most of the wealth is generated. And I'm glad to announce, uh, announce to you that at the Africa Investment Forum 2021 virtual boardrooms, which we concluded last week, we were able to secure investor interest for $5 billion for businesses of women. These include a woman entrepreneur in Sierra Leone establishing a processing factory for dried fruits, a woman entrepreneur in Nigeria doing leather bags from gold skins, a woman entrepreneur from Uganda establishing a share butter processing factory. And two women entrepreneurs establishing textile packs in Ghana and Nigeria, respectively, to process cotton into textile and garments. No bird flies with one wing. Without women, Africa cannot feed itself. Africa's agriculture, and indeed Africa's economies, will perform better when we provide equal opportunities for women. Women produce food in Africa. Women process food in Africa. Women farmers must thrive. Women agribusinesses must thrive. Because when women win, Africa wins. Thank you very much. Great being here with you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much, Dr. Adeshina, for not only the integrity with which you have led the African Development Bank, but the vision that has inspired that leadership, both as Minister of Agriculture and now at the ADB. And I think when we hear you, um, if you could see the chat, uh, you have a huge fan club, but I just want to say that when we hear you, it inspires hope and confidence in the possibility of what Africa could be, um, both under strong leadership and female leadership. Because of time, I'm just gonna ask you one question. And um, I promise I will not give you an exam, even though as a professor, I really wanna do that. Um, but first, Ian from London wants to know how we can make agriculture a sexy field in other countries? How can we make it appealing um, as a field that is worthy of both investment, but also to encourage the current generations to really invest and look at farming and sustainable farming as um, necessary um, and important for our future? But Thandi from Johannesburg is really concerned about us not adopting an industrial food complex. So how do we advance without falling into some of the same traps that we have seen in the developed economies? Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor um, Okediji. I'm a great admirer of yours. And, 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 I, and I must say that I've still come back to you in terms of the intellectual property rights as we deal with your vaccines globally. And I know that you are providing great leadership for us on that. So thank you very, very much. 
Now, with regard to the issue um, uh, of agriculture, you know, when I was appointed Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria, you know, people were used to ministers of agriculture wearing uh, buba and bubus and all of that, and they always saw me in my bow ties and all of that. And, and I remember some, somebody asking me, why do you wear bow ties? In fact, when I was going to be confirmed at the, at the Senate, they said, you know, are you sure you want to be Minister of Agriculture with your bow tie? I said, well, let me tell you something. I want you to change your mindset about agriculture because by 2030, the size of the food and agricultural market in Africa is going to be worth a whopping $1 trillion. And so the billionaires and the, trillion, uh, and the, the, the millionaires and, uh, and the billionaires of Africa aren't going to come from oil and gas industry. They are going to come from the agriculture sector. So agriculture is not a way of life. Agriculture is a mega business. So all of my life, I've been really making sure that we can get young people excited. And I'm really very thrilled with how many young people have gotten into agriculture because of, of that, because they realize there are opportunities in farm production, in logistics, in packaging, in marketing, you know, all sides of agriculture, you can make a lot of money. So, um, and, and, and I tell them, when I got Aliko Dangote, Africa's richest man to get into agriculture, um, then if you see Africa's richest man going in one direction, you better know he knows what he's doing. And so I just want to say, everybody listening to me today, you know, stake agriculture as a business because that is really where the money is. Africa has 65% of the uncultivated arable land in the world today to feed a world uh, a population. So that's a sector to be. So, um, and one of the things I want to say is that when I won a war food prize, Grace and I decided to dedicate the entire $250,000 for that uh, to create a foundation, which is called World Hunger Fighters Foundation. And the goal, get young people into agriculture as a business. So I really want to say agriculture is sexy, agriculture is cool, agriculture is a place to make money. And I love agriculture because, you know, um, my son who's a medical doctor in the US used to tell me, oh, dad, you know, medicine is better. I say, even doctors would tell you, uh, take three tablets three times a day only after food. And that tells you agriculture is even more important than medicine. Um, so there you have it. Um, and Sandy's question in terms of industrial agriculture. No, a lot of what we have to understand is that there is space for all. If you look at, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you from Pretoria, right? And or in Johannesburg, you know, or in Lagos or in Accra, or in any place or, you know, where you are, you have the city high line, skyline. You are small, you have, sm you have two story buildings, you have, you know, 50 story buildings, you what it is. There's a space for all. We must realize that most other farmers in Africa, 70, 80% are smallholder farmers. We want them to become wealthy farmers, not just simply producing food for themselves. And that's why I focus a lot on the issue of women. We also want to make sure that you have commercial farmers, right? The key is to mix small, medium, and large. We're focusing on the fact that 70% um, of, the, of the farmers are smallholder farmers and, you know, the small must grow. And there's no reason why smallholder farmers must be just what they stay in. They must grow. They must grow. And we must support them with policies, with technology, with access to market and infrastructure. One last thing I'll say uh, uh, on this is one thing we are doing to make agriculture really cool is by investing in what we call now special agro-industrial processing zones. We are opening our rural areas with investment in infrastructure, power, water, roads, logistic infrastructure, and all of that. So food and ag businesses can locate or transpose into those areas and create vast opportunities in rural areas. And what I will do, it will professor turn rural economies of Africa from zones of economic misery to zones of economic prosperity. And that's what I want agriculture to do, create wealth. That's what Africa has. We must be making money out of it and not poverty. I don't believe in that. Wow. Well, we could sit and, and talk for many, many hours. Thank you so much, Dr. Adeshina. Um, Dr. Adeshina, um, uh, you know, one of the things that's so important for everyone that is listening to you speak this morning is both the passion with which you speak and the hope and clarity with which you speak. I think this is crucial for the next generation and crucial for Africa's advancement. My father told me as a little girl, he said, Ruth, you can do anything. 
you can be president, you can do anything. And I remember thinking you're such an odd man um, to be an African man telling me this. Um, but he told my sister and I, and I'm so grateful because I hear this message that you are speaking about agriculture and the importance of Africa's future. So thank you so much. Thank you for joining us out of your busy schedule. And we are going to be watching for those patents on seeds. So listen, I'm coming after you if you don't take care of that. Thank you so much, Dr. Nishima. Thank you God so bless very you. much, Professor. Right. Okay. God bless you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Our next speaker uh, is someone I am delighted to introduce. And she's the Honorable Yvonne Aki Sawyer. She is the mayor of Freetown, Sierra Leone. And um, it is such a delight. She is uh, uh, an order of the British Empire. She became mayor of Freetown in May, 2018. And she has dedicated herself to an inclusive vision of the city's renewal. And she really has been at the forefront of COP27, the Conference of the Parties, driving the climate change agenda is what she will be speaking to us about today. It is an incredible delight and honor, um, as you've just heard from our two previous speakers, um, the capacity for the future food and water is so dependent um, on what we do about climate change. So we are really excited um, to have Dr. Um, in her honor, Her Excellency Yvonne Aki Sawyer with us this morning to speak, um, to give us an eight minute short talk on big opportunities for Africa's advancement related to climate change. Honorable Yvonne Aki Sawyer, over to you. Thank you very much, Professor, and um, thank you so much to um, Teresa and Africa.com for organizing this. Um, your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to be here. I wouldn't say I'm in the forefront of um, COP27, but I've been very involved in COP26, and we're looking forward to participating um, and setting out our our objectives and what we feel um, need to be our priorities as Africans going into COP27. Let me start off by just saying a word on climate change, um, uh, uh, the phenomena of climate change, and particularly the very strong linkages between the previous speakers. Um, agriculture and water are intrinsically linked um, with climate change uh, in, the, in the direction of climate change being a factor that's influencing, has the potential to influence them negatively. Uh, and so, so much of what has been said um, in, by the earlier speakers is only actually going to be realized if adequate attention is given to climate change and we're able as a continent to protect ourselves. So um, in the run-up to COP26, there was a lot of media attention given to, to, um, to that event. And I think speaking from the continent of Africa, it, it already begins to give you a sense of how important it is for us as a continent to stand together for the things that matter to us. COP27 is going to be happening in Africa. It's going to be held in Egypt and the focus is going to be adaptation, something which affects the global South much more than it does the emitting countries, the high emitting countries. And already we see a difference in the level of focus, media attention that's being given to COP27. And that tells us that if we don't fight for our space, if we don't protect our interest, then no one else is going to. So climate change is not new to anyone. Um, but I think what's important for me to highlight as I begin these few words or this short submission is where we sit as a continent in terms of emissions and impact. And where we sit is in an uncomfortable position of being responsible for maximum, the figures dif differ depending on who you speak to, but there is some agreement that it's a maximum of about 4% of the global greenhouse emissions which are creating climate change. And yet we are disproportionately affected by climate change. The impact of climate change on our continent is felt daily by the billions of people who live in Africa, whether it's flooding, um, whether it's landslides, whether it's drought, whether it's mudslides, whether it's extreme heat, 
all of these impacts of climate change are being seen by us in our cities, in our towns, in our villages. And they are devastating the livelihoods of farmers coming back to agriculture. They are de devastating the lives of ordinary businesses um, because with, with the impacts of climate change, with those natural phenomena or unnatural phenomena caused by climate change, you have a trickle down um, and sometimes much more direct than a trickle down as in the case of a landslide, but you have economic impacts. You have social impacts. Why? Because we see with these impacts of climate change, water shortages. You see with the floods, a lot of water around, but no drinkable water. Coming back to Wanjira's point, and of course, Wanjira, it's always a pleasure to see you too. Um, no drinkable water, fresh water sources being destroyed. And something else that we see, which sometimes we don't make a direct link between, is that the failure of, of agricultural businesses further drive urbanization with many people, millions of people moving and the estimate is that over 80 million people on the continent will be moving as a result of climate-induced, well, there'll be climate-induced migration moving as a result of climate change. Many of those movements are actually internal movements leading to increased urbanization. We know that the world is urbanizing. It's a phenomenon no one's gonna get away from. By 2050, the UN estimates that 75% of the world's population will live in cities, 90% of that growth will happen in Africa. But when there isn't planning ahead of that growth, when these informal settlements are mushrooming and springing up, it continues to have a negative impact on the provision of the most basics of services, of health, of education, the creation of jobs, the ability for there to be jobs. So you see that what is sometimes put into a box and described as climate change has devastating impacts right along the pathway of life, growth, and economic resilience on our continent. So what's there to be done about it? As we go towards COP27, it's already been declared that this will be the conference, this will be the COP of adaptation. But let's stop for a moment and ask ourselves, what came out of COP26? not enough, I think, is the general conclusion. In terms of a slowing down, a, a breaking of the curve, um, the, the rate at which global temperatures are increasing. And as those temperatures increase, the impact in Africa continues to be felt. In order for us to play our role in what emission reduction we could potentially do, but more significantly, in terms of adaptation, there needs to be more financing on the table. And that's something that was clear at COP26, that there hasn't been a commitment to meeting the financing gap that Africa faces as, some, as, as a continent that has not contributed as much to this problem, but is now being adversely and disproportionately impacted. A hundred billion dollars is what was slated to be put on the table for Africa for climate financing. That hasn't been seen, not enough of it. The commitment going into COP27 is that this needs to now be addressed and that there needs to be, as was said at COP26, 40 billion put aside specifically for adaptation. Another priority that for COP27 as set out by the Africa cities the Africa Center for Economic Transformation, they put out three. Let's fix the financing gap. Second, let's ensure that we make more use um, and there's more transparency about, about around carbon markets. In both speak, previous speakers, both Dr. Dishina and Wanjira, they mentioned the potential that Africa has for reforestation and with that, and afforestation, and with that comes the potential for creating carbon sinks, but we have not been benefiting from carbon trading. 
To date, only 2% of that trading is coming from Africa. And the third is to ensure that we're able to make, have better access towards loss and damage for there to be a real conversation which results in real financing contributions coming towards loss and damage. In other words, we're driving the bicycle, the West, the 90% of emissions coming from the G20 countries have been driving the limousine. There's been an accident. There's been a crash on the road. And we on the bicycle so far have been covering all the costs. That needs to be changed. There needs to be a sense that this isn't favors for Africa, but justice, climate justice, and in a, a commitment to ensuring that the damage to our continent that's come from the emissions from the West emissions from the, the G20 countries in particular and, and others, that those are being, that those, the cost of that is not being carried just by Africa, but it's being shared um, through adequate insurance schemes, um, however they need to be designed. So as we go towards COP27, in Freetown, we've been very, um, we, we, we've, we've been very focused on this. Um, we have introduced Freetown the Tree Town, which is our planting of a million trees. And this has given us a very real appreciation of how the financing gap has been challenging. We're very fortunate with support of the World Bank and by winning um, a prize from a competition with Bluebird Philanthropies, we've been able to secure just under $3 million, which is enabling us to plant those million trees, 557,000 already on the in the ground, 450,000 more will be planted by this July. We track each tree, technology is a big part, it creates jobs, it protects water catchments, and it, it enables us also to reduce extreme heat in the city. So we see these opportunities are here, but as we go to COP27, we've got to be focused as a continent to ensure that we make full use of, of our voices that we stand together um, and de de demand what we need to have because our agriculture and our water can only survive, can only thrive and only build the economies we want them to if we're able to address the challenges of climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor. And I am amazed. This is probably uh, a reflection of um, Teresa and everyone at Africa.com's lineup because we could not have planned such tightly connected themes and the urgency of the messages that, that have come forth this morning. And in particular, as you have given this really incisive surgical um, uh, set of remarks about what we must demand um, from COP27. I, I think it's so interesting because one of the questions, Mayor, that you have um, is how you have taken your credentials um, earned with distinction overseas and gone back to Freetown um, to be engaged in local politics. And um, this um, question is from Talani in Cape Town and, and she wants to know um, whether you've had a difficult time being so global, um, being a global African in a local space. And Munir from Tunis really wanted to know how do we get more Africans focused on climate change? Um, and I think the two questions are related so I'm making them one because of time. Um, um, and I think it's so crucial that you give some feedback to, to, to these questions because the urgency of the demand that you are asking us to make means that this message must resound um, for so many young people. So Mayor, if you could just address that very briefly. Okay, um, so global, global platform local action is precisely what we need nowadays. Um, so um, it actually, I think, works in our favor to be able to raise the issues that affect us locally. There aren't enough African voices on the global platform. Um, so to shape policy um, and to direct direct funding and to challenge to challenge 
um, the international sort of status quo um, going into these meetings. So more of us is necessary rather than less. Um, and onto the question of Africans being interested in climate change, we have no other alternative. We need to be ensuring that people understand that climate change is not this thing just about using paper cups, you know, and um, recycling in the West, but that on a day-to-day -day basis, it is the most it is the most damaging thing that is happening. I live in a city that now has 74 informal settlements, 35% plus of my population live in informal settlements. If you go and speak to people in these communities, many of them are rural migrants, people who used to be farmers and can no longer farm because they cannot predict the weather. Um, they, they have crop losses and because they don't have the financial resilience, they become bankrupt and they make their way to the city just to try to survive. And that has its own consequences. So for our future, whether it's, I mean, we lost 1,000 plus people in three minutes on the 14th of August, 2017. And there's, you know, there's so much that can be said about South Sudan, Uganda, Kenya, all over our continent. Climate change is our reality. We cannot distance ourselves from it because of language. Let's not use the language of the West if that's what we need to change. Let's make this more connected to the reality of our experiences. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, this is just both crucial um, and again, urgent. And the work that you are doing, I, I think so many of us are deeply indebted to you um, for your leadership, for your commitment to the local and making sure that the local has a voice at the global level. This is really, really crucial. Um, you don't know that we share an adopted son, Tony Oki, and uh, I was I was telling the Harvard students about this event, and 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 he said, "You've got to tell my other mom." I said, "Hello," and that she's saving my life, and so I'm passing the message on. I also want to tell our audience that. Um, you know, Mayor Aki Sawyer is um, incredible, not just for the work that she's doing now, but for the work that she left. Um, I didn't mention that she's a chartered accountant um, who holds a, a, an MSc in politics um, of world economy from the London School of Economics. And I, I say this because I think it's crucial for us to understand that the leaders that we have been listening to this morning are people of vision and sacrifice. And too often, the narrative on the continent is that we have terrible leadership who cannot um, sacrifice anything for the good of the people. And Mayor Aki Sawyer, you have, along with our other speakers this morning, proven that to be false yet again. So thank you, thank you so much. Our next speaker on Short Talks on Big Opportunities um, is someone that has been making waves um, for a very long time. And it is encouraging, I think, for us to know the degree to which um, we have been blessed as a continent and really, um, I, I think also um, undersold um, those who have served and continue to serve in critical conditions about um, the future um, for Africa. I am delighted uh, to introduce uh, to you the morning, uh, Dr. Vera Songwe. And actually she and I were on a panel together not too long ago. Um, and I'm, I'm just delighted to have her here again. She's the executive secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission um, for Africa. Um, and she is going to be giving her brief remarks. We actually were able to get her in between meetings. And so she'll be giving her brief remarks on making up for lost time, a better normal uh, for Africa. She um, was, is the first woman to lead this venerable institution, which is 60 years old. Um, and her reforms have really focused on developing um, ideas for a prosperous Africa. Um, so Dr. Songwe, we're going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. It's a pleasure to see you again. And yes, yeah, always uh, fun and interesting. Um, let me start, uh, first of all, by thanking uh, my friend, uh, Theresa. Uh, president of allafrica.com uh, for really um, insisting and get to, to get me to this uh, conversation. I, I'm honored uh, uh, to be part of it. I think part of it was I was thinking to myself, you know, what do I have to say uh, 
uh, in a, such an august audience with you know such distinguished uh, women presidents of the past who have all the experience and we should be listening uh, to them as opposed to talking. Uh, but hopefully um, as we listen and I have already uh, gotten so much from uh, uh, my sister, uh, the mayor and as well of course from uh, Akin, the president of uh, the African Development Bank so let me day to, 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 to discuss uh, making up for lost time, a uh, better normal for Africa in, 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 in the midst of all of this distinguished uh, presidents. Of course, Her Excellency, uh, President, uh, former President Joyce Bander, Her Excellency, Amina Gurib Fakim, Her Excellency, of course, a mentor to many, many, many of us, uh, President Ellen Sarif Johnson, Honorable Sarah uh, Kugwela, Madilia, I always remember your name because President Ramaphosa insisted on calling it many times. All the 18 women president and prime ministers being recognized today for their, uh, for the first time, several of whom are with us virtually, distinguished speakers, uh, delegates, uh, ladies and gentlemen, everybody, the youth, the private sector uh, that is with us uh, today in this conversation. Just the mere fact that you're here, I think is first and foremost recognition of the leadership that the former and present lady presidents are giving us uh, uh, on the continent and the need for many more of them and many more of this conversation. So again, uh, to Theresa, thank you so much um, for this maiden initiative and hopefully that we can have a lot more so that the interaction is constant and intergenerational, of course. It's a pleasure uh, uh, to be with the continent's most aspiring women who have shattered barriers all the time, continue to do so. And I think that is part of the new normal is women who continue and stay on many, many, many months and, and seasons after they have served in their official capacity to continue to serve the continent at that global level we we're just talking about to ensure that Africa's voice remains important in those forests that many of us will never get to, but you continue to get to and can defend us. Our discussion today has its anchor on a vision for a better normal for Africa we have lost time, it is true, but sometimes losing time does not mean that you have lost opportunity. It also may mean that you can create even better opportunity. And I think the vision for Africa's new normal really begins at that point. And, and maybe just to actually link uh, this conversation with the last conversation from uh, Mayor Sawyer is yes, we have lost time and yes, uh, uh, you know, climate change is upon us and, and we're struggling to see how we can fight it. But because it has taken us long to get to that conversation. Today we can talk and we can actually get into a conversation that begins to talk about how Africa can benefit uh, from the conversations around climate change. So I'm gonna talk about um, six different uh, areas where we can, as Africa, emerge much stronger uh, uh, from, from sort of this development prospects, this new, we are eight years to Agenda 2030, the global development uh, goals. Our Secretary General has just put out a new note called our common agenda, which is essentially a way of turbo charging, if you, in, in, the, in the currency of today, the booster shot for the SDGs is how to ensure that we refocus and we re reboost. Every time we talk about how we get to the SDGs, of course, the first issue that we talk about is financing. Where does Africa get its financing? How can Africa get its financing? We have heard, I'm sure many of you on uh, uh, listening to us today, we have heard so many times everybody tell us how, you know, Africa is about to get into a debt crisis. Africa is going to crash if this is not done, if that is not done. But I think one thing we have not heard enough of, and it's the only one thing that we take away from where we are today, is that because of climate change, Africa can create a different OPEC. Africa can create the organization of carbon sequestra uh, sequestration uh, uh, countries. And, and so this is my new term, organization of carbon sequestration countries. And essentially with that, it's a trillion dollar industry, right? And if we were able to do that and do that, uh, as, as, as the mayor was saying, we become a continent that can actually finance all the things that we need to do. The 600 million people that don't have light, the 800 million women that are in our farms that need uh, better access to equipment that ensure that they have better markets and technology to sell their goods. So there is, I think, something that we as Africans can today decide to say, we no longer need to keep begging for funds because we need, uh, of climate change or because it's hitting us. Yes, it's going to hit us, but can we respond if we come collectively together and decide that we want to demand at COP27, uh, which is now called the Africa COP in Sharm El Sheikh, a 
clear, transparent, and market-based mechanism for carbon pricing. This is achievable, and this will deliver for Africa 186 million jobs in the service sector, in the pharmaceutical sector, in the agriculture sector, in the services sector. So I think one of the things that we must do, and this is where our better normal comes, is that we see an Africa that comes together in a collaborative way to say, yes, we can do this. Now the, the, the countries of the Congo Basin, the 16 countries of the Congo Basin have already come together and are beginning to do that. But we need all of Africa to come together. What we need is four things. First, we need all countries to do their national determined contributions, put it on the table. We need every country to update its biannual report on climate. We need countries to begin the certification process of their forests. Not all green is green, uh, but many greens can, be, can, can, uh, can earn an income. So essentially, if we were able today to distinguish what kinds of forests we have, what kinds of green land we have, and this is work that we can do because of technology, and I'll come to technology in a minute, we will be able to then unlock the trillions. Many economies are not doing that. They're just thinking, okay, I have a few forests. Let me go and get a price for it. So you're getting $5. Why should you get $5 when you can get $100? So the effort that we need to make to move from five to 100 is minimal. The gains are enormous, not just for our economies, but for our youth and for our continent. So this is for me, the first new normal is Africa needs to move away from saying, we didn't create climate, we're suffering, give us money to say, we didn't create it, we're suffering, but pay us for what we have been consuming for you or what we've been saving for you. Because if we burn the peatlands of the Congo Basin today, the climate is over. We will unleash more than 1.5 degrees of heating of our climate. So Africa is today, I think, the savior of the climate. And we need to start talking in those terms and then say, because we're doing this, you know, let's monetize it and then let's develop faster and differently. Of course, we're not going to develop with coal. We're clearly not going to do that, but we can do it differently. So that for me is the first advantage, the first new normal that Africa needs to look at. The second one, to, uh, continuing in the spirit of climate change sustainability, we have seen on our continent and in many other places of the world that we must shift, we must move from a different kind of automotive system, a different kind of uh, uh, delivery system or transportation system to one that is cleaner, one that is safer, one that protects our environment. Everybody that talks about it talks about the need then for cobalt, the need for nickel, the need for magnesium to be able to produce the 60 million uh, electric vehicles that are going to be on our roads by 2040, 2050. To produce the 60 million vehicles that are going to be on our roads, so today there are, there are about four to five million electric vehicles on our roads. We predict 60 million by 2040. You're going to need those minerals. Where do those minerals reside? 70% of them reside on our continent. But again, we need to stop saying 70% of them reside on our continent. We need to move to transformation. We need to start transforming those minerals into something that's going to get into those cars. So we can move the automotive industry from Stuttgart to DRC, to Congo Kinshasa, to Lumumbashi, or to South Africa, because we have the minerals, we have the technology, and we should be able to do that. So again, a future for Africa is a sustainable future that begins to give us a price for carbon. A future for Africa is a sustainable future where we take our raw materials, and just to give you a few numbers, the exports of cobalt today from DRC, which is the highest export of cobalt on our continent, is in the order of about 7 billion. The whole cobalt industry is 11 billion, raw cobalt, the stone. If you move two steps up to the transformation of cobalt into battery precursors, it's a $271 billion industry. If you move three steps up, to the fabrication of electric vehicles, it's a $1.3 trillion industry. This industry begins in Africa, but what we do is we export the raw material. And so every part of that value chain after the stone is produced someplace else. Whereas Africa has the possibility, the capabilities, the technology, the innovation, and the youth to be able to do it on our continent. So there again, we believe that we can come together as a continent under the continent of free trade area agreement to see how we start producing this on our continent in a short future that will begin to deliver us those jobs and a sustainable economy. So again, a, a new future is sustainability, transformation of our raw materials on the continent in a way that delivers for us more services. This, everybody will say, yes, okay, this is you know long-term, medium-term, but two years is really short-term uh, initiatives if one wants to put it together. But then again, we have just come out of the COVID crisis and everybody's expecting, how do we recover from the COVID crisis? How do we actually beat 
uh, COVID before we go forward. And Africa has already demonstrated that it can do that and it can do it well. I think one of the things that has come out of the COVID crisis is an innovation but it's an innovation that is going to change the way Africa deals with the rest of the world in terms of our pharmaceutical sector. Before COVID-19, 96%, as you must have all heard so many times, of our pharmaceutical products were exported um, from outside the continent, almost 55% from Europe, 15% from India. But COVID-19 has brought that realization to fore because not only were we importing from these uh, geographies, but with COVID-19, these geographies closed their markets to Africa. Africa could no longer access what it needed. And so Africa came together and said, let's create institutions that can help us, pull procure, can help us begin to recognize our own local production, value manufacturing on our continent. Out of these initiatives, of course, led by President Cyril Ramaphosa and the Special Envoy Strive Nasuiya, Africa was able to create under the auspices of the African Union, three new institutions, which are going to be institutions that stand two to two, with global international institutions and we'll be able now to bring production back to our continent. So we we're importing $14 billion worth of drugs at 6 million jobs. If we can start producing more on the continent, that's what happened during COVID-19. And we are beginning to hear about, you know, pr production of, of vaccines on our continent. Already, of course, we had uh, countries that were producing vaccines, but we had never really highlighted them or put them in front. Many of us were still importing vaccines from uh, um, industries outside of the continent. But now we know that Senegal can do it. We know South Africa can do it. Morocco, Algeria, Kenya, Ghana, Ethiopia, of course, and many more. And the question is, how can we come together and ensure that those vaccines that we're producing and any other health material that we produce are certified? We have now created, it took us almost eight years to create the African Medical Agency, but because of COVID, we fast-tracked it under the leadership of President Kagame. We now have an African medical agency, which can certify, which can wake up in the morning and say, this vaccine is good and this vaccine is not so good, or this medication is good. We know today many of our African women die because we are all consuming you know, fake oxytoxin because there's no certification agency. Oxytoxin can be produced by anybody on the continent. Essentially, it is it, it no longer has a patent on it. So it can be produced very quickly, but we get a lot of, counterfeit on the continent because we didn't have the right agencies. What COVID has done is it allowed us to do that. It has also allowed us as Africa to be able to go out to the markets and procure vaccines in a concert as a collective under the African Vaccines Acquisition Trust, where we've been able to pool resources and say, as Africa, we can come to the table, not as beggars, not because we cannot buy it, but with an institution that allows us now to procure. Now we need to still go further. We need to make sure that African production is not just for Africa, but it can also be procured by uh, countries in other geographies outside the continent, because of course anybody who knows how markets work knows that you must have demand, right? We, may, we should, we sh can produce everything uh, uh, that we want to, but if we don't have any demand, then these industries will collapse. So now Africa, as a collective, we need to work together with the GAVIs, the UNICEFs of the world, to ensure that we are the, uh, in in those the COVAXs of the world, to ensure that we are in those pooled uh, procurement systems. Financing, we always talk about financing, and this is the fourth one. We've been talking for a very long time about how Africa needs more and better access uh, to financing. Yes, you've heard a lot about Africa's debt crisis, but Africa's debt crisis is true, a combination of poor governance, a combination of weak macroeconomic fundamentals sometimes, but it is also uh, uh, due to the fact that Africa does not have access to the kind of liquidity that countries with the same kinds of macro fundamentals have. And so if you take an example, just to break it down for you, a, an economy that is being run as like any other similar economy on the continent, when they go to the global bond markets to, 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 to access new resources, they can access those resources at 10% or even 1% of the cost of the resources. When Africa goes, we access it at 16, 17, 18%. If you and I go to the markets to borrow on the same day and I'm borrowing at 1% and you're borrowing at 10%, the probability is that you can pay at 10% is much higher. Hence the issue of the debt crisis. So for us as a continent to be able to tackle and deal with the issue of the debt crisis, we must be able to build our own capital market. We must be able to borrow in our own local currencies. And again, I think with the crisis, we are now, these conversations are coming to fore. We can now talk about them openly. We can begin to ask the question, is there a new normal for Africa where Africa can, first of all, develop its own uh, uh, secondary market systems, but in the global international financial architecture, can we change uh, the, 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 the order structure so that Africa has a bigger voice? One of the big questions that we are putting on the table 
of course, is that the African Union should become part of the G20 and make it the G21 so that as the African Union, we don't just have one voice in the G20, which makes many of the decisions about how Africa's development is financed, but at least we begin to have two or maybe three or four, uh, why not? And finally, in this conversation on the global financial architecture, we are beginning to ask about what the new normal must look like. A new normal has to be a new normal way when we have global financial crises, we do not get responses to how it affects Africa without Africa on the table. I think as Nelson Mandela said, anything that you do for me, but without me is against me. And so clearly we're beginning to see many of that play out in this last two crises, first in the COVID crisis, but now also with the crisis that we have at hand with the war in Ukraine and Russia, where decisions on how one restructures Africa's debt are being made someplace else and clearly are not effective. And so we must begin to decide on how we do that together. We're happy to say that with a lot of effort from the African finance ministers, we are now creating a forum where the IMF has agreed to talk with us about how we can develop and reframe this new financial architecture. Yes, we got $33.6 billion out of the SDRs, but do we need more? Do we need an automatic mechanism that ensures that when SDRs are released, some of them immediately go to African institutions like the African Development Bank and the African Exim Bank together so that they can, as Africans who understand where the shoe pit, uh, pinches, be able to immediately begin to allow and allocate resources. Finally, uh, uh, the way forward, human capacity, human skills, digitization. We must ensure that as Africa gets into this digital age, as Africa embraces digital technology, we're able to do it differently, we're able to do it better, we're able to do it much faster. Yes, today we only have 17% of our continent that is digitized, connected, but even that 17% is not connected with fast enough speed. I must stop here and say that 34% of our youth age 15 to 24 are connected. So yes, the overall population 17%, but that margin where we need you most connected is slightly bigger, 34%, it's not where we need it to be. So moving forward into the future, it's much cheaper. In Togo, we just saw, again, uh, Strive Econet and Google landing new cables, trying to make digital connectivity much faster. Africa has adopted an African digital strategy. Digitization is the way to the future. It is the way for jobs. It is the way for us as Africa to insert ourselves even more forcefully into the global community, to demonstrate our skills and innovation. The next unicorns will come from there. We know that as uh, uh, Akin was saying, the president of the African Development Bank, with digitization, we can do better in agriculture, we can create more jobs, we can improve our productivity. So everywhere we turn in climate change, of course, we need digitized methodologies to understand how we map our surfaces. Our economies are going to be increasingly digitized and for women, for leadership, even for governance, which is important. I'm sure that most of the leaders on this uh, forum will tell us that the, the quintessential uh, 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 tool that we need for prosperity on our continent is governance. We need improved digitization. And I believe that today Africa is leapfrogging because we can access it much faster. We can do much better with it. There is still a lot more that needs to be done, but we believe that we have already embraced it in many countries on the continent, Kenya, of course, Nigeria, Cameroon, Ethiopia, Togo, Benin, many, many more countries are embracing this digital revolution in a way that we have never seen before. So the way for the future for Africa is really going to be that. One of my most en enhancing moments in the last few years has been going to Kenya, where everybody, and I'm closing where I started, everybody was talking about the fact that with electronic cars, jobs are going to be closed down, Africa is going to disappear. But when you go to Kenya, you visit things like the iCloud factory, 1,000 young kids, engineers, P uh, mathematician programming the cars that are driving in California that seem driverless. So essentially the brains of the cars in California are sitting in Kenya. And so there is so much hope, but we need to be able to take advantage of it and ensure that we do more and better with it. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to this conversation. As you see, Africa can, Africa is, and for sure prosperity is our, uh, our doorstep with the kinds of leaders that we're honoring here today. Thank you. Wow, Dr. Songwe, um, I did not, um, and I'm now glad that I did not take too much of your time um, with my introductions of you, but I think that it would be unjust. And as a lawyer, I am always striving for justice, um, but I think it would be unjust to not let our audience realize both um, the wealth of experience and dedication that you have brought to the continent and 
just as this initiative, Women's Heads of States, are, um, is honoring our political uh, leaders as women, uh, it is vital for us to acknowledge your leadership on the economics of the development of the nation. For those who don't know, um, Dr. Songwe uh, is a PhD in mathematical economics, um, has held number of positions at um, the IFC and the World Bank. Um, and really importantly, you know, the Forbes and Financial Times and all these folks have, have identified her as one of the most influential Africans of our, of our generation, really, um, of perhaps of our, of our history as a continent. Um, but it is her heart for creativity and persistence that Africa must reach its full potential for which we are incredibly grateful. Thank you for the work, for the sacrifice, for the intellect and the creativity that you bring uh, to what you're doing. Um, and we know that you need to go. So we're going to let you go back to your meeting, um, but there's so much, there are many, many questions for you, including how to pick between science and technology versus nutrition and education guidance, of course, for our governments. Um, I work in intellectual property. So the science and technology piece, our, our IP infrastructure legally and administratively is, is a shamble across the entire continent. Um, so there is much work to be done. And what is gratifying is that we can do it. That is what you've reminded us today. It can be done. It is being done. And we need to just scale up. So thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Our next speaker, speaking of science and technology and a hope for the future, um, it is just an incredible joy and with great excitement, especially for me as a patent lawyer and scholar and someone who has worked on the transformation of, of Africa's uh, patent systems, working with governments. It is such a delight um, for me to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Kuseni Dlani. And of course, because we are running short on time, I'm going to um, simply say that he is at the forefront of the pioneering work of manufacturing vaccines on the mm -hmm. continent. And uh, he is of course the CEO of Aspen. We are incredibly excited about what you are doing and what Aspen has catalyzed the continent to do. So over to you for your brief remarks on big opportunities for Africa's development. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Ruth Okediji. It's a great honor and privilege to be here. I'd like to start by making two corrections. Uh, I am not a doctor, I'm a mister, Hussein Idlamini. I don't have a PhD. And secondly, I am the chairman of ASPEN, not the CEO. We've got Stephen Saad, who is our CEO and is doing a great job in that regard. It's an immense honor and privilege to be with our iconic women heads of states that are here with us today. I feel immensely inspired. Her Excellency Ellen Johnson Selif, former president of Liberia, our mama piece, as I have gotten to, to learn from my brother, Dr. Adesina. Her Excellency Amina Kurib Fakim, our former president of Mauritius. Her Excellency Joyce Hilda Banda, the former president of Malawi, and the Right Honorable Sarah Kukongelwa Amadila from Namibia. It's a great honor and privilege to be here. I'm here to, to say to you all that Africa is ready to be able to lead the charge in being self-sustained in terms of vaccine manufacturing. And uh, I'll share with you the story of Aspen. Aspen is a, is a proudly African company founded in South Africa and is now operating across 50 countries in the world. And our four product footprint is distributed across 150 countries. We've got 23 manufacturing plants across the world uh, in countries such as Germany, France, the Netherlands, and other first world economies. And of course, here in South Africa, we've got uh, three facilities that we use for manufacturing healthcare products. And, but the flagship uh, that we're talking about for, for today's purposes is our vaccine manufacturing capabilities and capacities that we have here in South Africa. I'm sure we'll all agree that the COVID-19 pandemic really unleashed an unprecedented 
global public health crisis, which disrupted lives and livelihoods across the world. Although comparatively speaking, Africa's mortality rates are lower compared to other parts of the world, but the economic impact, the social impact, the, the, as well as the psychological impact has been far more severe and will live with us today. I would like to address you just on, on the basis of just three, three or five points that I want to share with you. I mean, the first point I'd, I'd like to raise is that vaccines are the most effective instruments that we have uh, in, uh, to overcome any pandemic, and that includes the current pandemic. There is no other intervention in anywhere in the world other than clean running water, as we heard from Wanjira area on, that has saved more lives than vaccines. So the need for Africa to be really capable of supplying its own requirements in terms of vaccines, it's really one of the most important wake up calls for all of us. And we need to focus more than ever before in building the capacity to be able to do so. It is very disappointing that despite the major feat that was achieved in global healthcare and science innovation in, in the form of delivering a vaccine to the market within 321 days, which was by, by all accounts, a, a very, very progressive achievement. Africa still found itself on the back end of the vaccine queues because of vaccine nationalism. We saw a lack of global social solidarity as countries that had resources were holding vaccines and really prioritizing they, they are citizens. And the clear message there was that Africa, you are on your own and you've got to look after your own destiny and you've got to take care of the needs of your own people. And I think the challenge that now we have, is I see it more, more of an opportunity, in fact, is for us to double down in terms of building world-class scalable capacity to be able to manufacture our own vaccines. There are certain statistical trends that are happening that uh, we should be aware of. Uh, 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 which are familiar to all of you here. We are seeing the developed world now just administering second booster shots uh, for 25 year olds, while in Africa, we've got 75 year old women that go without vaccines. And we see that in Africa, 99% of the vaccines that are used are actually imported from outside of, South, of, of, of Africa. And I think the challenge going forward is to be able to build local African capacity to manufacture vaccines. And we are doing that as Aspen Pharmacare at our flagship facility here in South Africa. And we've been working very closely with the African Union as we had from Vera Songe in terms of some of the initiatives that have happened in terms of building institutional capacity at a continental level to be able to make sure that Africa works in a coordinated way. So we, as we sit today, only about 18% of Africans have received just one dose of COVID-19 vaccines, whereas other countries uh, are far, far north of 50 or 60 percent. And the target that we have is really to vaccinate 70 percent of the African population. And it, we cannot emphasize the agency of moving with the speed that is required. The vaccination campaign is important in the sense that we all know from the evidence that Vaccines do help to really deal with the issue of uh, severity of illness, hospitalizations, and reducing fatalities. We've seen uh, with the Omicron variant that it has been less severe amongst those that have been vaccinated uh, uh, than those that have not been vaccinated. And most of the people that have been hospitalized in most parts of the world have, have not had their vaccines. So we need to start managing our own destiny. As Aspen, we're very proud of the track record that we have in dealing with pandemics. The HIV AIDS pandemic was one such challenge, which Aspen contributed to addressing and defeating single-handedly, or maybe not single-handedly, but very significantly, also using our manufacturing facilities here in South Africa. And in the mid-2000, we also had the outbreak of multi-drug resistant TB in Wazulu Natal, and uh, we were ready as a company to play a role. And we're very pleased now that with COVID, we are also actively playing a role uh, across the world, not just through the vaccines, but even in the wave, first wave and second wave 
our medication was used to help cast, uh, uh, patients that were on ventilators and also help patients that needed muscle relaxants, which are some of the portfolio of products that we have. We also have dexamethasone in, in our portfolio, which is also helpful to treat patients who are infected with COVID-19. So now we see the next frontier of our fight or our involvement in this uh, pandemic is really being a, a powerful and positive force for good in producing vaccines for the whole of Africa. Our mission as Aspen is to make sure that there is one dose for every African. One African, one dose. The capacity that we've invested in uh, at our manufacturing plant will enable us to produce 1.3 billion uh, doses per annum so that we can be able to meet the needs of, of the African continent. We set up our sterile manufacturing facility a few years ago. We did not know that there was going to be a COVID and the, the issue of vaccine manufacturing and, and really building sterile capacity is a space that is highly regulated, uh, requires high investment, and obviously has got high barriers to entry. We're very pleased that we were proactive in terms of really reading the global health landscape and uh, identifying areas where there could be requirements for certain uh, products. And we, we identified uh, investment in our sterile capabilities as a key priority. What we do at our facility, we, we formulate, we fill and finish uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. We were contracted by Johnson & Johnson uh, to manufacture their vaccine. Uh, and we have so far manufactured between uh, 170 million and 180 million doses from our, our factory. We have allocated capacity for Johnson & Johnson of uh, 300 million uh, doses. Uh, we are by far one of the key uh, contract manufacturers for Johnson & Johnson globally. And our factory is, is a world-class facility that is regulated by the FDA, European Medicines Agency, and all regulators from other parts of the world. So this is something that we are very proud of. And more importantly, we invest a lot in, in young people, and especially young women professionals in the engineering space, in the pharmaceutical space, we, we have had the privilege of hosting a few presidents visiting our facility. When they go there, it's the young black women professionals that we've invested in and, and really are leading the charge in the producing vaccines for the whole world, but producing medical products for the whole world right here in Africa. It just shows that Africa is capable of doing things for, for herself. Uh, Dr. Adesina was saying agriculture is cool. I want to say, Vaccine manufacturing is cooler because you become part and parcel of a, of, of a global solution to a global problem. And Africa has always been seen as a recipient of charity, but now we are able to be looked to, to provide solutions. Uh, in, in France, we played a very key role and to the extent that we, our, our CEO was awarded the highest award that the French president can ever give to a foreigner uh, who is not French. And um, that was really something that was very humbling to, to all of us. And that is something that I, I think is a proof that we have what it takes. And there was a um, comment by Dr. Otegichi earlier on as well that, you know, people tend to, uh, you know, underplay African talent, but we have the best business minds, scientists, technology specialists, innovators right here in Africa. We need to build the right ecosystem to be able to build companies of scale that can be global, that can be part of providing global solutions to global problems using their African base. We have a facility that manufactures uh, vaccines for the world and now we'll be manufacturing vaccines for Africa. We reached a milestone a week ago uh, with j, &J where we signed the license uh, agreement to manufacture our own vaccine, which will be called Aspenovax, which will be manufactured uh, branded and distributed by us as Aspen to customers uh, across the continent. And uh, that will assist us to be able to deliver on our mission of one African, one dose. And that is something that is a major breakthrough in, in our connected? business and in our company. In case, okay. we, are very, we are very proud of Aspenovax because it's the first 
COVID vaccine, which is manufactured by Africans in Africa for Africans. And indeed, we'll, we'll also want to argue that for the world, because it's so important that we should globalize our reach and uh, African uh, manufacturers should not just be restricted to the African market, they should break through into uh, first world markets and into other parts of the world, because we have proven that we, we can be able to do what other countries in the world can do, what other companies in first world countries can do. So going forward, in conclusion, what we need is really the whole world to, to support and rally around Africa's role in global vaccine manufacturing. And the issue of market access, which was mentioned by Vera earlier on as well, is so key. We, we cannot invest in African vaccine manufacturing capacities and at the same time deny African manufacturers access to the global vaccine market. And that is something that we have to work in collaboration with all role players. Multilaterals have to play their role. The rich countries must play their role. And the AU and African governments must also work in partnership. I'm very confident that we have what it takes to win in this game and to play in a way that is compelling and in a way that is also as world-class as it gets or as other people can do it elsewhere in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Dlamini. Um, you said that you are not a doctor, but I, I beg to correct that. You have been very modest. Um, and while you are not a formal doctor, indeed, you have been engaged in the work of healing since the HIV crisis. Um, I did not, for time purposes, elaborate on Mr. Lamini's, um, Lamini's uh, bio, but I think it's important for our audience to know that in the midst of the HIV AIDS pandemic, which took so many lives, he was among the team that pioneered the first generic antiretroviral. And so when I say doctor, I do it African style. You don't need a degree to be a healer. You do not need a degree to have contributed for so many years ceaselessly and tirelessly to the health of Africa. And it is exciting that you have secured this right to manufacture uh, vaccines giving us the independence from imports um, for COVID-19. There were two questions for you that you already answered um, in your wisdom. And again, you said that you are not the CEO, you are just the chairman. Um, but as my grandmother would say, you are the neck that is turning the head. And so um, titles apart, we are so grateful. The questions you had were really related to how do we manufacture vaccines globally, not just for Africa. And as you have just emphasized, we are faced with all kinds of challenges, market barriers, using the patent system, the intellectual property system a lot of times, and other non-trade related um, requirements that are problematic and that will need to be addressed. But the pioneering work you have done, I am confident that there will be a way through, not just for Aspen, but for other um, manufacturers of pharmaceuticals, and that in, in Particularly, we are going to see not only the independence um, in manufacturing, but the independence in drug development as well. So the work for you, Mr. Lamini, Dr. Lamini, the work for you continues. We are grateful. Thank you for answering um, the questions during your talk. And we look forward to all that you will do going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our last speaker. Um, in our series, Short Talks on Big Opportunities for Africa's Advancement, um, is someone that I am just thrilled to introduce. Um, and she is the Executive Director of Africa for Human Rights Watch, um, an organization that is near and dear to my heart from the days of my law school with um, Mikhail Matua and so many others uh, who really have been crucial in creating the civil and civic infrastructure um, for us to be freer um, on the continent. Mauzi Shegum. Uh, is um, the person who oversees Human Rights Watch um, in over 30 countries on the continent. 
uh, she comes with a unique understanding of justice, the work that she's done um, in Nigeria, robust knowledge of governance at the macro level, and a compassion for victims. And it is just a delight and an honor to have you, Mazi, for a few minutes. Please share with us big opportunities for Africa's advancement. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Kitiji. Um, good afternoon, Excellencies, everyone, wherever you are. My very warm thanks to Teresa Clark and the team at Africa.com for inviting me to be to speak alongside this inspiring line lineup on this panel um, um, and people doing great work across our continent. Um, today, um, I'm going to make my, my comments really short because I know that we're out of time. My role really is to serve us a reminder, a reminder about the role of women in Africa and where there are still gaps for us to fill um, so that Africa will fulfill all of its potential. I want to talk to us about um, ensuring and being deliberate to close the gap in access for women and girls in three areas. The first is education, the next is health healthcare, and the final one is on access to economic and political participation. At the end of that, I would give us a few recommendations um, to move us forward. Now, um, since Teresa talk, talked to me about this event and, and told me about the number of women presidents and heads of government um, that Africa has produced, I was completely shocked, um, like many of you. Um, but then on, on reflection, um, when I thought about this for a bit, I, I became disturbed um, because if you, if you think about Africa's population as of today, um, it's over one, almost 1.4 billion people and with a sex ratio of 1,000 1, to 1,000, that is 1,000 males to 1,000 females, meaning that Africa, African women and girls represent 50% of its population. 22 women only in this period of time that Africa has been independent of any colonial um, domination, it is surprising. Um, and I think that, that we can, if we take our cue from there, I celebrate all of these 22 women and the women doing great and excellent, excellent things across different sectors in Africa, but we are just not enough in the right places. There is not enough of us. Change has come slowly. It has come increment, incrementally. Um, as of today, um, we have just two current um, female heads of government um, in Tanzania and um, in, 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 in Ethiopia. African women and girls um, continue to suffer large inequalities. And, you know, as, as we, 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 we think through all of the positives that we've heard from my, pan, my co-panelists um, since the beginning of this event, um, I, I just kept thinking to myself, where is the place of the women in all of this? And it starts one with the education. Achieving parity in education is critical for progress on other dimensions of, of gender equality for Africa in every sector. And, but we continue to have persisting discriminatory policies and practices that impede access for women and girls, especially when it comes to education. Enrollment is a first point of, 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 of challenge. And then you have child and early marriage um, continue to plague many girls across Africa even today in 2022. And then we have some countries that have introduced policies and laws that bar and impede re-entry for girls, for school girls who get pregnant and mothers who are teenagers. Um, we must be deliberate to target women um, and girls for access to all of these resources, including education, technology, digital connectivity, access to the internet, and everything else um, that is available to people across Africa. Educating its female population is a human right that Africa, that is imperative for Africa um, and its overall development. We must ensure that equal and equitable education of girls alongside boys um, that will help us to close the gap 
in productivity, whether it's in the workforce, it's in, it's in agriculture, it's in access to water, to technology, to vaccines, all of the great things and advancements that Africa is bringing on board and introducing to the world, whether it's in health, it's in development, we need the girls and the women to be alongside. Although we have started to close some of the education gap in some countries, many in many other countries, these discriminatory laws and practices continue to deny girls access to the education that will help give them the skills um, to take their place in society and occupy leadership roles and become presidents in Africa today and tomorrow. And I will go quickly to an example um, from the, the, the recent experience that we've had with COVID. Um, the pandemic disrupted education of over 1.5 billion students globally. But we noted that girls are disproportionately negatively affected and girls on African continent even more so than elsewhere. Students and teachers grappled with virtual online classes, but nearly 90% of students in Africa had no home computers. 82% of them had no internet access. These are gaps that we must fill. We also continued to um, record and document that during the lockdowns, Africa's existing high adolescent pregnancy rates and teenage pregnancies increased. Again, another area, another gap that must be closed because all of these gaps continue to exacerbate intergenerational education um, inequalities for African girls and women. Um, and I'm quickly going to jump to healthcare. Um, violence against women, well-documented, well-researched, but not enough results um, for us to con congratulate ourselves on. It continues to be a risk factor and a trigger of a range of sexual, reproductive health and mental health outcomes for women and girls. Gendered barriers to comprehensive sexual and reproductive health services continue to plague Africa, many African countries. Some are doing well, but too many are lagging behind. And so also we have low coverage of keep reproductive maternal and child health services. Uh, maternal, uh, maternal mortality rates still account for the largest share of global maternal deaths. Africa can do better and we must do better when it comes to the health of our women and girls. We must seize the opportunity of the global pandemic and the opportunity to build back better, to close these gaps in healthcare infrastructure, equipment and services um, that have been exposed by the global uh, public health pandemic. Uh, now I move very quickly to right, the right to participation, the right to economic participation. We have various gaps, including the employment gap, pay gap, unpaid work that many women find themselves stuck in, um, limited access to capital and um, 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 assets, um, and then, you know, the, the economic vulnerability that continue to plague women. Women um, continue for first employment gap. Women with equivalent education continue to be likely, less likely than men to be employed. I'll move quickly to the pay gap. In many African countries, women continue to earn much less. This is a global problem, but we were zeroing in on Africa. The women continue to earn much less, between 50 to 75% less than men. When it comes to unpaid work, women and girls in Africa continue to bear the burden of unpaid care work, whether it's at home, outside the home, it's domestic, it's in the society, women's jobs, women's roles are considered to be on, um, um, unpaid. Um, and usually they suffer for it without acknowledgement, without encouragement, without any earnings from those that they serve. Um, limited access to capital and assets. Um, women continue to be plagued by lack and low savings, uh, a lack of access to capital, low savings and, you know, just startup capital to run any business. They continue to depend mostly on the informal economy. And this continues to make them vulnerable. Um, African, Africa has the highest number of women in vulnerable employment anywhere 
in the world. These are statistics that we, we must pay deliberate attention to and prioritize for attention. Final point is on the rights to participate, political participation. Um, and, and first, you know, just the entry point. Political parties are the gatekeepers of access to political power. Only 12% of women are represented at the top leadership of political parties across Africa. I have so many examples, so many friends, many colleagues who have tried to dabble in, 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 into, into politics and they get beaten down, they get insulted, they get abused just at the level of the political party. The next problem that they face is lack of finance, financial resources. The prohibitive nomination campaign costs continue to impede access of women to political participation. Um, like I said, they face threats, abuse, um, violence, threats of abuse, and in fact, some, in, in, in some cases, physical violence, uh, and all of this combined con to continue to keep women out of political parties, um, um, politics, and power. Now, when it comes to representation, we have made some marginal progress, and I, I, ha I have to acknowledge that. Women occupy 24% of the 2,113 parliamentary seats across Africa. 7% of top executive political positions are occupied by women. Rwanda leads this pack with 61% of women, uh, women parliamentarians, while my dear Nigerian, my own home country, the most populous in Africa, has is Australian from the bottom with only about 3.6% of women in any political um, position. Now, Africa needs to close all of these gaps. The inequality and inequity gap is key. Closing this gap is uh, uh, key to Africa's development and progress. The continent can no longer afford the cost of missed opportunities to address the fundamental issue of unequal access of women and girls to education, healthcare, and economic and political participation. The time to act is now. I'm going to stop. Um, I, I, I skipped some slides, but I think um, we're okay here. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Mousy, uh, for what somebody in the chat referred to as, the, as a reality check, but it is profound that we have concluded this segment on short talks on big opportunities with your presentation, because it makes what um, Teresa and her team um, are doing today, this uh, Women Heads of State initiative, even more profound. These are statistics on the ground today. This is what the reality is for African women today. And to have these Women Heads of State, my dear sister, uh, Sarah Benguela Amadila, who I met years ago in Namibia, um, when she was Minister of Finance to Honorable uh, Dr. Joyce Banda. I mean, these women, to be where they are today, given what the data must have been 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. It is quite unprecedented um, what they have personally achieved. And we wanna say thank you to you because the work of maintaining a civic space to make it easier for the prime ministers and the presidents to rise is a work that is grueling, often done in silence, but it is the foundation of all that we are hoping the continent will do. And um, as the in-laws of Obafemi Awolowo University uh, uh, professors, I am grateful to that institution and to you for the passion and dedication and clarity with which you do your job. Thank you so much. We have now concluded this segment of the program. And it is a delight for me to hand over to our gracious and unbelievably um, amazing hostess, Teresa Clark, who will moderate um, the next session with her excellencies um, who are with us today and whom we celebrate and honor. Teresa. Wonderful. Ruth, I must honor you once again and thank you for your tremendous job in moderating. Um, you've done a, a fantastic job. You know many of, uh, of our speakers and you understand the topics and you understand the continent. And I thank you for bringing your wisdom and grace. We are going to shortly 
go to our women heads of state. But before we do, we are privileged to have a special message today from the president of Coca-Cola, Bruno Pietracci. And I wanna thank once again, Coca-Cola for being our sponsor for this event without which it would not have happened. And I think as I did at the early stage of this, I wanna make sure that I give a special appreciation to Patricia Abuzua, Emily Weta, um, Amil Benchik, El Hausin, and Jesse Loishuhora, who we have worked with very closely to bring to today's program to you. So we're going to hear from Bruno and then we're gonna go straight into our women heads of state after that. So Deborah, over to you and let's, uh, let's get Bruno's message rolling. Our esteemed guests, business executives, media, and all participants, good morning or good afternoon, depending on which part of the world you are today. Uh, thank you, Teresa and everyone, for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, we are excited to be part of launching a Women Heads of State initiative, through which uh, African Women Heads of State are coming together to discuss the future of our beloved uh, continent. Let me start with a quick uh, introduction. I am Bruno Pietracci. Uh, I, I am Brazilian by origin, but I've been uh, living uh, and briefing in the Africa continent for uh, the past four years uh, in the vibrant city of uh, Johannesburg. Coca-Cola has been present in, in the continent for uh, the past 90 years, and we look ahead for the next century. The first Coca-Cola bottle sold in South Africa in 1928, and 10 years after that, we were opened our first offices in the country. We also have a presence uh, that is seven or eight decades long in important countries of the continent, such as Nigeria and Egypt. And we are very proud to be present in every single country uh, in the continent. We are in all 54 countries. If we look at our, uh, our main ambition for the continent is to become a triple growth engine in which we can grow the business, we can go the talent from the Africa continent, and we can grow the communities in which you operate. So let me go in more details uh, on what we are doing in each one of those. Uh, I'm happy to report again that we are present in every single uh, country across the, the continent. We have nearly 20 bottling partners and more than 50,000 uh, associates that work for the Coca-Cola system in 130 uh, bottling uh, plants. We not only are a driver for economic growth directly through our uh, uh, operations, but also we contribute to the trade uh, and through uh, the, the communities in which we operate to drive uh, economic uh, inclusion, primarily in new youth and, and women. Uh, we aspire to become a total beverage company that not only serves uh, sparkling soft drinks, which was the origin of our company, but also plays in the water, the juice, dairy, and coffee arena. As an example, in the Africa continent, since uh, 2019, uh, we acquired a company in Nigeria called Chi, uh, which plays uh, very strongly in the dairy segment. And we are learning about this new category uh, in which we already started to expanding to new countries such uh, as Ghana. Uh, I'm particularly passionate about the talent uh, on the continent, and we are making all the choices that we can to support uh, talent development. So uh, in, in a nutshell today, more than 90% of the Coca-Cola company had come is uh, of African talent, uh, and also with a heavy weight on uh, female talent, which represent 54% of our total um, headcount. But the biggest uh, play of all is that uh, we cannot succeed in Africa if the communities in which we operate don't succeed as well. So we want to be a positive force of growth of those communities, driving prosperity, taking care of the environment, and driving uh, economic growth. We recognize that we have an important role to play given our size, 
And this is not what we do, it's more what we are. It's part of the, our DNA in Africa since the beginning. That's why this year in January, uh, we announced the launch of a new platform called JAMI, uh, the new Africa sustainability platform that should be the umbrella for us delivering our purpose of refreshing the world and making a difference. Uh, we deliberately chose the name JAMI, uh, which is a Swahili word that means community, society, people, because it represents who we are uh, in our uh, DNA. There are many areas that are touched by the JAMI platform, and I'll cover a few with you today. So, for instance, in waste management, the Coca-Cola company has made a global commitment uh, that by 2030, we'll be able to collect and recycle every bottle we put in place. And we took it very seriously in the Africa continent uh, with uh, our bottling partner, CCBA, uh, developing new packages that are returnable, be it returnable glass or returnable PT. Uh, we also moved uh, most of the countries from the green bottle of Sprite towards a clear bottle of Sprite, which increases the value for the recyclers and ultimately enables this PT to be uh, recycled. Uh, we also uh, uh, are uh, using a recycled PET in one of our brands, uh, Valpre, in, in South Africa. And we continue looking at new technologies and new partnership models to drive uh, waste management across the, the continent. A second area that I'm proud of is uh, water stewardship. We plan to replenish 100% of the water used in our manufacturing uh, in manufacturing our products, products by taking actions to replenish uh, 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 through our communities and through the, our uh, operations. Uh, through both waste management and water stewardship, uh, we have a bias towards uh, economic inclusion of women and youth. And JAMI will promote and generate uh, entrepreneurship opportunities, be it through teaching how to be an entrepreneur or to providing uh, income uh, generation opportunities. Uh, we value the importance of partnership. So one out of the box idea that we had uh, 10 to 15 years ago was about leveraging the breadth uh, of our uh, distribution network to put it uh, uh, at disposal of governments so that we can take medicines to remote parts of the countries. So in South Africa, we support the government through taking HIV medicine uh, throughout the country. Same holds true for Mozambique uh, with malaria. And uh, through that expertise, uh, we are also able to play a very important role when the pandemic outbroke nearly two years uh, ago. So through our Project Last Mile initiative, we were able to support uh, governments across Africa in uh, developing a cold chain uh, uh, distribution system to take the, the vaccines where it was needed and also lending capabilities to the government so that uh, they can uh, benefit from our know-how uh, and better serve uh, the populations in the different corners uh, of the continent. Thank you again. Uh, it is a privilege and an honor for Coca-Cola and for myself to be part of such a preeminent uh, forum. Uh, we look forward to hearing the remarks of the women heads of state who are uh, today with us uh, and they, they will comment uh, on the six teams for uh, Africa's uh, advancement. Thank you again and enjoy the forum. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Bruno, for your remarks. We have a couple of questions for you that have come in from the audience. Um, Nomsa from South Africa has a question and her question is, can you please talk about the recent news report that Coca-Cola and its bottling partners have committed to a 100% recycling and 50% and recycling rate and 50% recycling content in pet bottles by 2030 as part of the world without waste strategy globally. How will this policy be applied in Africa 
given that African consumers do not recycle at the same rates as other parts of the world? Thank you for the question. And uh, uh, we in Coca-Cola are very tuned to the consumer uh, trends and the consumer needs. And in the recent years, we've seen an increasing concern about the protection of the environment. Uh, in 2018, uh, our CEO launched a global pledge uh, which is World Without Waste, in which by 2030, we plan to collect and recycle every bottle in the continent. And funny enough, uh, we have a winning model that was developed by the continent, uh, in which through an industry uh, uh, co-led responsibility, uh, we got together and uh, we started uh, stimulating the cooperatives uh, in South Africa. And through that journey, after almost 15 years, we already collect two thirds of the PET that goes into the marketplace. Interesting enough, uh, this learning enabled us to move much faster in other regions of the continent. So this initiative that was only present in South Africa is now present in 13 countries across the continent. And uh, we were able to double our uh, collection rates just in 2021. So I'm very excited about the potential as we continue rolling out this uh, initiative of Petco-like models. Great. All right, and we've got another question for you, um, Bruno. This is coming from Nigeria, from someone named Tunde. Um, and this question is, through the pandemic, we've learned a lot about supply chains. Um, can you provide specific examples? And I know you've provided one already um, in talking about South Africa in your remarks, but this person's asking if you can provide more specific examples of the role that Coca-Cola has played through the years using its distribution logistics network to distribute um, medicines and critical supplies on the continent. We know this is an important piece of what you do as Coca-Cola. So perhaps you can talk a little bit more about that. That's what this one person from the audience wants to hear about. Hi, Thunder. Thanks for the question. And I miss coming out to Nigeria. I hope I can be there soon. Uh, I, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, one initiative that I'm particularly proud of is a partnership that is now 10 years old with uh, between the Coca-Cola Foundation and the Gates Foundation to take medicine uh, to the different corners of the continent, be it malaria, be it uh, HIV, or depending on the country, uh, the relevance for these countries. We kind of adapted this approach in the past two years to be able to manage cold chain distribution uh, and uh, support throughout the pandemic. If I step back a little bit, I believe the role Coca-Cola can play is uh, actually lending some of our capabilities to governments uh, in order to support uh, governments in delivering better services to communities. So another example is that throughout the pandemic, we landed some of our procurement uh, resources to governments so that they could get up to speed on the new challenges of buying uh, uh, personal protective equipment, on and on. So uh, we are very close uh, collaborating with the different governments to identify what is the need and if there is a sweet spot in, you, in which we believe our capabilities can be landed, uh, we'll, 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 we'll make everything that we can. Thanks again for the question. Okay, thank you very much for that message, Bruno. And now, we are going to move on to the piece that we are been waiting for, and that is the women heads of state. That is why we are here today to honor you, to thank you. Um, we're going to start with the Right Honorable Sara Kungongelwa Amadila. She is the head of government, not a head of state. I think it's important for us all to appreciate the difference. Our definition of head of state includes women who are heads of state or heads of government as prime ministers or presidents. But Sarah wants to make sure that we understand governance in Namibia and in many countries in Africa. And that as the prime minister of Namibia, she is the head of government. 
She's a member of the Southwest Africa People's Organization, SWAPO. She's been a member of the National Assembly of Namibia since 1995. She served as the Minister of Finance from 2003 to 2015. She is the first woman to serve as Prime Minister of Namibia. This is the second time that she has joined us on Africa.com. She joined us for Women's Day event two years ago at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, during that time, I had a wonderful opportunity to get to know her and learn that she graduated from Lincoln University, the same college in the United States from which my grandfather graduated. So we have that in common. But since then, I've also had an opportunity to get to know her through the media, to watch what she has to say, to see her in action. And I can say that she is a woman of tremendous integrity, tremendous insight. Her compassion and desire to serve comes through whenever you hear her remarks or see her speaking within the community. It's quite clear why she was chosen as Prime Minister of Namibia. And I'd like to now introduce you to the person that I've come to know, Sarah. Thank you very much, uh, first, for inviting me to participate uh, in this dialogue and uh, for moderating uh, our, our session. I also want to appreciate uh, Your Excellency, former heads of states of Liberia, Mauritius. Um, so I wanted to start by saying uh, in Namibia, the Prime Minister is the head of government administration, with the president being an executive president who is head of state and government. And as head of government administration, the Prime Minister coordinates the work of the cabinet and is the leader of government business in, in parliament. I wish to appreciate this initiative, as I was saying, which provides a platform for sharing lessons and perspectives on the advancement of our continent. Uh, indeed, Africa abounds with opportunities and possibilities should harness to better the lives of our continent. As 2063 encapsulates the development agenda of the continent, which seeks to harness the abundant opportunities that exist to tackle our development challenges. The continent is blessed with abundant natural resources, which unfortunately have not significantly benefited our citizens, many of whom in poverty, as they have been exported with little or no value addition, while revenue flows in the form of taxes have eroded the revenue that have flown uh, into our country because of these tax avoidance practices. The abandoned resources present significant opportunities for sustainable economic growth in Africa, that we are development through value addition and employment creation, as well as increasing national income. To realize this benefit, we need to optimize firstly the management of our natural resources through effective governance and to promote skills amongst our young people for them to be able to drive the development and participate in the harvesting of these natural resources that we have and also benefit from them, as well as to promote the industrialization through value addition to our natural resources. We also need to address climate change because many of the developing countries are heavily affected by uh, climate change and uh, we believe that the calls for developed nations who are the largest contributors to pollution, for them to assist the most affected countries who are mostly developing countries, which are the least producers, should continue, should indeed heed this call and provide this much needed support. Now, Africa has a very youthful population and we will be able to harness this demographic dividend of our youthful population by investing in their training, supporting entrepreneurs uh, of, 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 of our young people so that they have to engage in, in, in businesses. And we need to promote reproductive health care to specifically care teenage pregnancies, which disrupt the education, relegate them to poverty, and ensure that their children are also born into poverty, which becomes a vicious cycle. Need to harness the the benefits of digitalization by using um, uh, online systems to provide services. And I must say that in Namibia, we have started to, to do that. We provide um, a services from financial institutions, from government, through uh, 
fighting of, 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 of taxes online and also procurement online and payments to government online and from government online and we have prioritized the automation of government services as a way to harness the benefits from digitalization. We should promote gender equality to ensure that the, the majority of our population who are women who are left of the margin of our economy are indeed brought on board and they are empowered to be able to realize their full potential to contribute to higher economic growth and also to empower themselves so that they are lifted out of poverty. And specifically, we need to support the informal uh, trading sector where women are the majority and other sectors such as agriculture and tourism where they are also the, the majority. We need also to ensure that they are bold enough to have a quota system to promote their participation in decision making, both in politics and in the economy, in the public sector and in the private sector. And we need to assist them to get access to finances and to markets so that they can optimally engage in businesses. Africa needs to invest in infrastructure where we have huge backlog to ensure that the production centers are linked with markets and that we are in a position to export our goods to international markets. And we need to optimize the development of agriculture, which uh, is the basis of the livelihood of the majority of our population, especially in rural areas, where women are leading the rural economy. So it becomes very important for Africa to optimize investments in agriculture, to modernize it, to support value addition, and to support the secure land tenure system in order to enable women to access credit and to engage in production um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the rural area. We need to promote trade amongst ourselves as Africans, and we need to increase our participation in international trade and optimize the benefits that we get from international trade through the trading of our resources, which should be value added before they are traded. We need to manage the impact of climate change. I have talked about the need for developed nations who are the largest polluters to support the developing countries, which are the most affected by uh, pollution to cope with the impact of uh, uh, climate change. And we need to optimize opportunities for sourcing uh, renewable sources of energy and other environmentally friendly means of production. Uh, we need to promote effective governance in our countries and promote food, peace and security because there can never be any development uh, if there is instability on the continent. Last but not least, we need to fight COVID including by ensuring that our people are vaccinated. Um, of recent, we have seen an increase in the supply of COVID vaccines to African countries, but the anti-vaccination campaign that is being propagated in many of our countries has discouraged people from uh, taking up vaccines, and therefore we remain susceptible to COVID, and this would prolong the negative impact of, of COVID on our economy, which has resulted in job losses and increased impoverishment of our community. And then finally, uh, be able to empower women if they continue to be subjected to, to abuse, uh, not only in general, but at home and also at the workplace. So these are issues that Namibia prioritizes and we think that they are important priorities for development on the African. Excellent. Um, Prime Minister, I wish you could see the chat. Um, many people here are commenting, um, in, you know, in addition to the, the brilliant words that you have shared with us, they are commending you for your tenacity and the effort that you have made to speak in all, under all costs. So we want to thank you for making such an effort while you are traveling to be with us. Um, our next speaker is Her Excellency Amina Grib Fakim, the former president of Mauritius. So uh, let's see if Amina is there. Over to you, Amina. It's great to be with all of you on this wonderful 23rd March. And it is indeed a great pleasure to know that I'm sharing this platform with the past 
heads of state and also current ones. And uh, of course, these great women leaders who are making changes in our continent. Food is three times a day, seven day a week, and throughout the whole year for those who can afford it. But what we heard over the past year, at least, is statements like this, which were absolutely heart wrenching. We will probably die of hunger before COVID reaches us. This was the plight coming out of many countries in the South, including some African countries. Yet the right to food is one of the basic fundamental human rights. In fact, food should be bountiful on the African continent and for many reasons. The continent is home to 60% of the world's arable land and can become the breadbasket of the world. From Ethiopia's teff to Sahel, Sponio, Sorghum, Millet, Yam, Cassava, all these resources can provide us with our carbohydrate and starch. The neglected and yet highly nutritious leafy vegetables and fruits are also a rich source of nutrients. This diversity of crops, including the unutilized and neglected plants with genetic resources, can ensure not just food security, but can also alleviate chronic hidden hunger. One must also bear in mind that the business value of this sector alone has been estimated to weigh almost $1 trillion. So what does this represent for the continent? And I think it goes beyond the food security issue. It is a mean to create jobs for the youth where innovations can be added, not just to enhance production, but create added value for the transformation of this raw material into high value products. Who knows, maybe the next best-selling chocolate brand will be made out of Cote d'Ivoire or Ghana. The best cosmetic brands will come from the sheer butter, baobab, argan oil coming out of West and North Africa. Who knows, the natural dyes that will provide tantalizing hues to African design will come from our plants growing all over Africa. How do we get there? We will need a total rehaul of our agricultural systems, which remain perniciously rain-fed. 85% of African agriculture is rain-fed, and one can imagine the risk that this represents in the light of a changing climate with the rainfall pattern that has gone changed dramatically and over the past years, and unfortunately, more of such changes will come. Where is the investment in our post-harvest treatment of our farm produce? Where is the investment in the necessary tool and technologies that will help adapt to a changing climate? Where are the institutions that will certify the quality of our produce so that they can be traded across Africa and make full use of the recently approved Africa Free Trade uh, Agreement. When do we start talking on our traditional knowledge seriously? When do we take this information seriously, this precious information that has been handed over to us by forebears? And we need, we need this information and transform those amazing plants and the accompanying recipes into medications that are culturally accepted and acceptable to one and all. Where are those flagship institutions that will provide the teaching and learning of agriculture and become the reference, not just for the region, but for the world? Where is the investment in the women of Africa, those who toil the soil and feed our families? When do we change the stereotype that African agriculture is that woman toiling the dry soil with a hoe and a baby on her back in the hot sun. Yes, it is possible, ladies and gentlemen, to have a food secure Africa. It is possible to convert our beautiful continent into the breadbasket of the world because we are going to be holding in our midst almost 2 billion, more than 2 billion people by 2050. And we are going to be providing 1 billion of our youth as resources, their human capital. So where are we going to 
how are we going to transform that landscape to make to make the future a beautiful one it is not a dream but that can fast become a reality provided we start investing in our young brain in our young minds in our institution in our regulatory framework in the intellectual property that will help drive this sector into money making apparatus wealth creation for the benefit of our people let us start by putting our heads and mind together and work towards a prosperous africa through agriculture i thank you for your attention thank you for those remarks madam president we have a question coming out of uganda and the question is how does africa take advantage of artificial intelligence on the one hand while preserving those important farm jobs on the other hand. For Africa, we need a mix of both. Uh, why I say this, uh, very often countries, I think of the Sahel region, for example, when they take loan for multilateral organization, they take loan, let's say, for the field of agriculture, they will take the loan and the support that comes with it, be it in the form of technical assistance. And often, unfortunately, the agricultural practices which are being foisted, I will say, within that loan to this region is that they're not adapted. So we will have to have these technologies rolled out, but at the same time, not forgetting that precious traditional knowledge, the way the farmers have been doing agriculture since time immemorial with amazing results have to be flagged into this. So we create this third way between technology, science, traditional knowledge, of course, with the dose of technology. And I think with this mix, we can see a prosperous agriculture on our continent. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Teresa. We appreciate your support. You're welcome. We're going to keep going with our heads of state. And I want to thank the next speaker, Her Excellency Joyce Banda for being with us. She's been here since the beginning of this session, listening to all of the presentations. We are very grateful for your deep engagement with this, Your Excellency. Um, I've had the privilege of meeting Her Excellency Joyce Banda. And I have to say that when I met her, she was unlike any other female leader I've ever met. This is a woman who is not afraid to be vulnerable, to tell her truth, and as a result, her authenticity and her genuine nature come through in a, in a very unique way. Um, I know that you, you know, everyone is pressed for time, we're running late. I know you have remarks and I will invite you to give your remarks, but I just want you to know that at the end, I have to ask you a question or two, a special question or two about some of the things that I know you've spoken about publicly that people wouldn't expect someone who was a former president of a country to talk about. So will you afford me the opportunity to ask you an extra question when we're done? Because I just want everyone to understand exactly who Her Excellency Joyce Banda is, because you are in a league of one in terms of who you come to the table as. So let me stop talking. Let me turn it over. I think everybody knows who you are. You were the fourth president of Malawi. You served as a president from 2012 to 2014. You became the president following the sudden death of the previous president. You are the founder and leader of the People's Party, which was created in 2011. You're an educator, a grassroots women's activist. You were previously the Minister of Foreign Affairs from 2006 to 2009. You were the vice president of Malawi before you became president. And you've served in many, many roles as a member of parliament, minister of gender and child welfare. Um, let me just stop there. We're just privileged to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope that you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you very, very um, well. Thank you. Um, uh, I would like to start by thanking you, Teresa, uh, for organizing this important virtual conference. And I'd like to thank our moderator and for, especially for inviting me. I want to recognize in a very special way, my fellow leaders participating in this conversation this afternoon. My focus uh, is on three presentations that were made earlier, namely 
making namely making 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 for lost time and um, closing the inequality gap and securing Africa's food supply. I'll conclude by demonstrating how we are building bridges by providing two short uh, case studies. Since the Beijing conference in 1995, our preoccupation was to close the gender gap, which we broke down thematically into 13 critical areas of concern. They included poverty, education, health, women in decision-making, environment, science and technology, cultural and traditional practices, the girl child, among others. We as Africa picked five of them to be our priority agenda list, namely poverty, education, health, women's decision-making, and the girl child. However, for African women, it was more complicated to close the gender gap in our selected priority areas because of retrogressive cultural traditional practices which cut across all and other underlying barriers that made it difficult for women to make any progress in closing the gap. Hence the push for the Maputo Women's Protocol uh, in 2003, which uh, addressed the cultural traditional practices specifically and the has been ratified by 42 African Union member states, including my own Malawi. Between 1995 and 2020, Beijing plus 25, African countries had made great strides in closing the gender gap on poverty through numerous poverty alleviation interventions, education, health, girl child, putting women in decision-making positions and addressing retrogressive cultural practices so much so that we gathered a lot of lessons along the way. Under women in decision-making positions, thematic area, we have managed to put women in high decision-making positions better than other continents, because I know some continents uh, and countries that ha have, been, have had a, a democracy for 200 years that are still trying to get one woman into state house. But we have had the presidents and prime ministers as well as vice presidents. Africa has had six female presidents and as we heard today, we have had 22 women since the 70s. But in the recent past six, the country with the highest number of women, fem I mean female members of parliament in the world is on the continent of Africa, Rwanda. And fortunately, although in 1995 in Beijing, we agreed to return to our countries to occupy positions of leadership and did better than most continents. We did not have a very clear strategy on how to support those women who get into that high office to remain in office. So almost all who served as president did not serve longer than two to three years with the exception of President Ellen Selich. Subsequently, some of the gains we had made in closing the gap at that level have been lost. 27 years since Beijing, we only have one female president in Tanzania and one non-elected president in Ethiopia. It is well known though that Africa benefits when its women serve as heads of state, when its women participate in leadership. We strive to do what is right when we get into that job. We are empathetic, we take risks, we focus on large projects, but also we pay attention to small social projects for grassroots people. Most importantly, we appoint fellow women to leadership positions. During my tenure, I appointed the first Malawian Chief Justice, Secretary to the President and Cabinet, Solicitor General, Head of Law Commission, the Malawi Police Deputy uh, Commissioner Inspector General. I, I also championed the appointment of the first female secretary, uh, uh, sec executive secretary of SADC. I made 100 appointments in my country. I would also like to share that three of us leaders on this panel are converging into Malawi around from the 7th and the 9th of April to continue to push for generation equality agenda. 100 Malawian young women leaders and 50 senior leaders 
including President Ellen Selig, President Catherine Sambapanza and myself, will be holding an intergenerational conference to push for equity, not only in Malawi, but also across Africa. On the 9th of April, 1,000 women in the informal sector and agriculture will need to discuss on the margins of this discussion, their own issues. African rural women are ready to upscale in agriculture. They lack support, they can't wait, and we must support them and support them now. Secondly, we made huge progress in improving women's health. I was glad to listen to the other presenter this afternoon who talked about the gender gains that we made. And the, we reduced maternal, uh, we reduced child and maternal mortality, in particular on the continent. For example, through the African Union campaign on accelerated reduction on maternal and newborn and child mortality in Africa, Kama, that appointed me as goodwill ambassador in 2009 Maternal mortality on the continent was reduced by 44% from 965 per 100,000 live births to 542 per 100,000 live births. And in my own country, in Malawi, we managed to reduce maternal mortality from 675 100, uh, against 100,000 live births to 460 during my presidency 2012 to 2014. But as if this all this was not enough, because it is not acceptable that one woman should die giving life. And while we were running around fighting maternal mortality, as if all the other diseases were not enough, COVID, COVID struck in 2020 that eroded the gains that we had made in only two years. As we speak, the full scale uh, impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is not yet fully known, but we know that women globally and those in Africa have borne the brunt of this virus because the first findings by researchers show that poverty has worsened, teen marriages and pregnancies have worsened, with the 200,000 girls dropping out of school in Malawi alone, and gender-based violence has worsened during the pandemic. All these affect women. Disruption of economic activities has also contributed to massive job losses, pushing families that once had an income into poverty. And women who occupy lower cadre jobs were the first to go. While the fourth industrial revolution went into full swing, it kicked out low tech staff, majority of whom were women. The disruption of the education system converted homes into classrooms and the increased women's unaccounted and paid work and escalated the domestic chores to home-based tutorials while office space retreated to homes. Overnight homes repressed offices. This overcrowding of homes exposed more women and girls to psychological, mental, and physical violence while turning homes into public spaces and conference sites for Zoom meetings and all these new home-based working methods. The crowding out of other diseases by COVID-19 hype has pushed prevention and treatment of other diseases out of the hospital priority list. And budget with homes taking more responsibility as caregivers, further burdening women and the girl child who end up taking care of patients and become more exposed to more vulnerabilities outside the home and school environment. 2020-2021 witnessed some of the highest instances of school girls' pregnancy in recent times. We therefore must account for lost time. And we also account for the increased burden on women's unpaid work during the COVID and post-COVID era. The post-COVID recovery agenda should have a specific budget and stimulus packages targeting women and girls. There's also evidence that during the COVID-19 pandemic, the top 1% to 3% of the richest people in the world became richer. Is it not fair for the world to expect that, to expect them to invest this wealth in the post-COVID-19 recovery agenda? Is it too much to ask 
I would like to appeal to these companies and organizations to invest in the areas most negatively impacted by the pandemic, particularly in the women and children in the developing world. On my part though, my organizations, we have come up with initiatives for holding our communities together, creating livelihoods and hope for the best in the near future. I'd like to share two case studies on how we are building resilience in communities during the COVID dispensation and beyond. We are making efforts to ensure a food secure Africa that includes scientific work. However, there's a lot more that needs to be done to ensure Africa is food secure. We need to invest more in promoting indigenous technology, knowledge on food security, which involves knowledge about soil fertility, disease resistance, and fast germinating and growing crops, best way to conserve soil, pest and disease control, best method to preserve food, best adequate storage and water management techniques. We have seen papers that highlight this as an important aspect of food security, but little action has been made and inadequate support provided to translate theory into action. Communities need to have access and uh, access, control, and ownership of resources that would help them become food secure. Allow me to share the two initiatives that I mentioned earlier. For the last 10 years, the Joyce Banda Foundation runs a project called Market Women's Activities and Initiatives, MWAI. And MWAI is an acronym, but in my local language, it means luck and opportunity. So the village woman thinks she's lucky. This is a national movement of 400,000 women countrywide. The last two years, MWAI has mobilized 5,000 of its members to diversify and grow chilies and other cash crops that have export potential and ready, and with ready of takers overseas. It has identified for two years these women and supported them, provided training, extension services, and ensured that they get the best price for their crop. The first time a chili grower in Malawi is getting two to three dollars per kg, the highest in the history of our country. In 2021, I registered another organization that seeks to take a holistic approach in transforming rural communities called Community Development Initiative. This organization seeks to build sustainable, resilient communities. This will be achieved by working with communities to build what I call smart villages. The main features of the smart village will be one, modern houses, two, clean water, three, environmental management, four, food and nutrition security, five, business, particularly agribusiness, six, clean water, seven, a clinic, eight, a school, and nine, early child education and feeding centers. Each family would be allocated 2.5 acres to produce food, crops, cash crops, and plant trees to restore our degraded environment. I have said before, and I say this now, that agriculture as a business will help transform many lives in the rural areas of our continent, and in the end, realize sustainable socioeconomic development. I'm a farmer and an exporter myself of chilies. In years I have been a farmer and exporter, I have learned firsthand the challenges farmers face to access finance, to run their business, and even to graduate from small farmers, medium and large scale. This week, we heard yet again that the African Development Bank has raised $100 million for women in agriculture. What is it that small agribusiness women on the continent should do to access this money? This far, organizations supporting women in agriculture are really struggling. And I'm grateful that our distinguished uh, president of the African Development Bank, uh, Dr. Anderson, is part of this discussion. I'll be glad to continue with this discussion with ADP. Malawian women farmers need help and need help now. There has been years when they have lost all their yield due to lack of markets. Yet those companies that might help struggle to raise finance, uh, might, might help them to raise finance, don't turn up. 
I have always asked, why rural women who till the land, plant the seed, nurture the crop, harvest, store, process, cook, eat last and least? So for me, it's a moral obligation. We are former presidents, yes, but we must ensure that when we have left that office, we are hands-on on the ground with the people, transform their lives and help them realize their full potential. I rest my case. Thank you for listening. My, my, you must my. rest your case. You must keep going with that case. Smart villages. How did you come up with this idea of smart villages? Well, when I, when I was president, I, I tried. So if you go in most of the countries, I think three quarters of the districts in Malawi, you will find a model village that was built during my tenure in those two years. Now, what all we have done is go back and looked at the model and then just upgraded them to have clean water, to have uh, clean energy, to have microfinance. So apart from just having modern homes, which were built by, the, by us as government, hand in hand with the communities. Uh, so uh, that, that's, uh, that's how we came up with that initiative. But now it has the um, I mean, environment, tree planting. Today they were planting trees all over the country in those, uh, in, those pro in those project areas. So that's what we are doing after office. Well, let's continue about after office. You started by telling us about something that is taking place in April that your foundation yes. is organizing. Tell us a little bit more about your foundation and the work that you're doing, the work that you continue to do as a leader. Yeah, um, the, the Joyce Banda Foundation has three components. It has the primary and secondary schools, it, has the, it feeds 20,000 children a day. Those are just feeding, 35 feeding centers across the country, but it also has this women's organization of 400,000 women that do a small informal business at grassroots. But most of them now are in agriculture. And that is why I'm very keen to continue this discussion. I was very excited listening to Dr. Andesina. Yeah, but the event that is happening on the 789 I, uh, we, we are convening because in, the, in Paris in 2020, they set aside six years to focus on this agenda, generation equality agenda for until 2025. And the uh, Netherlands, Canada and Malawi were chosen. One issue that has come out Beijing plus 25 is that organizations headed by women that are supporting fellow women are only getting 1% of resources raised to uplift lives of women and children. And so based that, these are some of the issues that we shall be discussing for three days. President Ellen Selif is traveling to Malawi, Catherine Panza is traveling to Malawi. It's a very rare opportunity for women in Malawi because I've always said that those of us that have been there that are here now must provide support to upcoming women that are the younger women so that they can also find their way into leadership without the challenges that we who got there first. You talk about a very important point and that is the funding of these organizations. You have a foundation, um, Madam President Johnson, Sirleaf has a foundation. If someone on this phone wants to contribute to these foundations, do you take contributions from the public? Yes, we do. I mean, I mean that, that's how we survive. Even including this event that we are running for three days, it's been, it's, it's, it's been tough raising resources to get the uh, women, 1,000 women, rural women to come, to get my, 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 my colleagues to come, to get the young women leaders to come together. But we have struggled and we have managed. And now we are, we, we are set to have that event. So anybody who wants to uh, support our initiatives, my, especially the Joyce Banda Foundation, I mean, it's, it's very easy to find us. And to even travel to come, I always wish people to come to visit, uh, especially to visit the women at grassroots who are in agriculture. In, the 2020, in 2012, when I was president, I introduced a program that I called a Kawa family. And so in one area where I went to visit two weeks ago, 15 women had received the Kawa family. Now they have 140, a full scale pro, a dairy, dairy program. So, Life at grassroots can be transformed only if we uh, help assist 
the rural communities because you know what they know what to do they know how to take themselves from one point to another all they want is our partnership excellent and let me just ask you a question or two um, when I first heard you speak, you spoke from the heart and told many personal stories that helped to guide your leadership as a woman leader, the priorities that you made for women and children. Um, and you told about how you'd been there, and so you knew what women needed. Can I ask you to, to share some of that with our audience today? I know what you want me to talk about. <laughs> I, I, I know that I shared that um, by age 26, I was married. I mean, by age 26, I had three children. By age 21, I was married. I ended up in that marriage for 10 years. It was such an abusive marriage that after 10 years, I had to walk out. And two years later, I went shopping for a better husband and got one. <laughs> and I have been married since then. He ended up being my partner, my uncle, my best friend. We worked together. He was Malawi's first chief justice and Swaziland. I mean, Malawi's chief justice and Swaziland chief justice. And so we have stood and supported one another as we went up the ladder one step at a time. And the reason why I share this story, because I know there are thousands of women, millions if, if I may say, locked up in abusive situations, not knowing what to do and not wanting to take the next step or to walk out away from abusive situations because they are afraid of uh, the perception of the public because where we, some of us come from here in Africa, People feel socially that you should be married and that's the best place to be. But you can walk out and start all over again. I share that story deliberately and I am glad that I've received the positive uh, feedback many, many times of people who have heard me speak and say, that day I made up my mind, I packed my bags and left and started all over again. And I think it's tremendously courageous of you to share that. And I know that sharing it, I'm sure there are people on this call who are touched and motivated and inspired by seeing what you have done and the benefit of having a wonderful husband as you do. Um, as we do these um, legacy interviews, which we will be doing with you shortly, one of the things that's very clear when we talk to women leaders is that you must have a partner like your husband, because if you don't, you can't succeed. Yes. And so we, we commend you on so many levels, personally, professionally, and otherwise. Um, this is just the beginning, and we look forward to um, supporting the Joyce Vanda Foundation in every way that we can, and to working with you as you continue to build your legacy. And we thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Oh, and if you could see the chat, everyone is just going crazy, <laughs> as I knew would be the case. Thank I'm you. I'm shopping for a better husband. <laughs> <laughs> we want to know what store you went to. <laughs> okay. And now we have a... No, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and now we have a surprise visitor today. I mentioned her when we started. She's not going to deliver full remarks, but we have another head of state. We wanted to um, bring in the Francophone uh, piece of, of, of Africa, and we wanted to ask Her Excellency Catherine Samba Panza if she might just give us a few words and a greeting. Um, as you probably know, she was the seventh president of the Central African Republic. She was president from 2014 to 2016. She represents a true Pan-African diaspora. Um, she was born in Chad. Her father is Cameroonian. Her mother is from the CAR. She, before she went into politics, she was a businesswoman and a corporate lawyer. She's had a tremendous career long before she entered politics. Before she became president, she was also the mayor of the capital of the CAR. She's had a wonderful career and continues to have a big impact in the Francophone Africa world and beyond. Um, we thank you for, for being with us today. And we're going to ask you to just say a brief hello to our audience and, um, and let you know that we are thrilled that you're part of this and we will be doing your legacy interview. And so 
let's um, turn it over to Catherine, to Her Excellency Catherine. Let me not be overly familiar. Merci, Madame Président. Merci. Je, je voudrais solliciter l'indulgence et la compréhension de l'ensemble des personnalités euh, à ce forum. Je suis obligée de parler en français et je vous remercie, Madame Teresa, de bien vouloir traduire oh, juste une petite euh, intervention qui ne sera pas longue compte tenu des problèmes de d'interpretariat. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, I speak a little bit of French. Um, those of you who speak better than I do might want to offer a better translation, but she has greeted us and said that she's going to be speaking in French today and that she wants to acknowledge this initiative and that we will continue to be engaged with her going forward. So thank you very much, Madam President. Merci beaucoup. Je voudrais quand même euh, dire que je suis particulièrement enthousiaste d'être avec vous toutes, euh, avec les, les anciennes femmes chefs d'État, les actuelles femmes chefs d'État, les femmes premiers ministres, les dirigeants d'Afrique, à ce sommet virtuel et de rejoindre ainsi l'initiative euh, des femmes africaines chefs d'État. Wonderful. She says that she is enthusiastic and committed to being engaged with this initiative of the women heads of state, the women heads of government. Oh, I think my French teacher might say that I got a passing grade, maybe not an A, but at least I could uh, communicate some of that. Thank you, thank you, merci beaucoup. Je salue très respectueusement la présence de notre aîné, l'ancienne présidente du Liberia, Hélène Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, de l'ancienne présidente du Malawi, ma sœur Joyce Banda, que j'ai toujours plaisir à écouter, et de l'ancienne présidente Amina Gurib Fakim, ancienne présidente de Maurice. Well, I think that everybody understood that because of the names that you used and the fact that you are acknowledging the presence of your fellow heads of state and hello, fellow heads of government. Excellent. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to go over to our last head of state, and that is Her Excellency Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Before we hear from her, let me just say a word about her. She really needs no introduction on the continent or anyone, anywhere else. Everyone knows that she was the first elected female head of state in Africa. She served as the 24th president of Liberia from 2006 to 2018. She won the Nobel Peace Prize. She did so because of the nonviolent struggle for safety of women and women's rights to full participation in peace building work in her country of Liberia. Madam President, who authored a book by the same name, Madam President, uh, was born in Liberia. She studied economics at Harvard University. And when she returned to Liberia, she worked for the government and in, she worked as the Minister of Finance prior to the military coup in 1980. She worked within the banking industry, she worked at the United Nations, and she was elected president in 2005 and then re-elected in 2011. She has a nickname besides Madam President, and that is she's also called the Iron Lady of Africa. We are privileged to have had an opportunity to interview her, and you, we, will, we will also have something forthcoming. We'll mention it again. I mentioned it at the beginning. Um, she and Her Excellency Amina Garib Fakim will be doing a conversation between two women heads of state talking informally. And that will be something forthcoming. And please keep your eyes out for that. So with no further ado, let's go over to Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Thank you very much, Madam President, for joining us today. We're very happy to be celebrating Women's Month with the launch of the Africa.com Women Heads of State Initiative. And we're very pleased that you've taken a few moments to share your thoughts with us. As you know, today we're talking about the six opportunities for Africa's advancement. And in particular, we're talking about a wide, a wide range of issues that you have worked for throughout your career as president. Things like closing the inequality gap, securing Africa's food supply, 
looking out for agriculture and making sure that Africa achieves her rightful place in the global stage in terms of agricultural production. Can you tell us in a few moments your thoughts on the role that women's leadership is playing in achieving these specific policy goals and perhaps a word or two about what you did in your presidency towards achieving some of these specific policy goals around agriculture or income inequality? We'd love to hear from you on those topics. Well, let us say first that uh, women's leadership women's decision in all of those areas have to first come from the people who are affected and the people who benefit by those policies. And the truth of the matter is, when it comes to agriculture, any of those things, in our societies, the poorer societies, where the informal sector plays a large role it's the women at the bottom who dictate what the policy should be. And so that means ensuring that our farming women, our marketing women, our women who serve in those places, like they're the ones that serve in the schools and the hospitals, they play a leading role in those places. Uh, therefore, our policies must be to ensure that they are given space, they are recognized, it doesn't always happen that way. But I think as women leaders, we need to look at our own laws and our own policies and see, are they conducive to promote those women who are at the levels where you may consider them even disadvantaged? Um, what did I do? I recognize in my case that Many of our young girls were not going to school. They were in the marketplace and in the farms with their mothers. We made primary education compulsive and we removed any fees, public fees from that. I dare say today we have close to parity uh, in our schools, particularly at the primary level. Um, when it comes to women, I realized that our market women were virtually selling their wares on the ground or in small stalls or in places where uh, the conditions were inappropriate. I launched the um, Surly Market Women Fund. And on that basis, we build markets all over to give them better conditions. And let me go back to education. We had the Liberian Education Trust, you know, who was really supported by good friends in the United States. And that one was to build 50 schools, train 500 teachers, and have 5,000 young girls carried through school. We more than achieved that goal. And so perhaps the one area where uh, I, I didn't do as much as I wanted to, was in the political sphere. I wish I could have had more women uh, in the legislature, in, uh, in our legislature, uh, our parliament. You know, I couldn't. I wish, I always said, I wish I could have had an all women cabinet. I could not, because at that point I did not find. And you know, this is a problem, you know, he said, and I found myself facing the same thing that we didn't have the women with the, or just what you wanted to be in a position. But what I did do was to put them in strategic positions. The ones that women had not held before. Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Commerce, you know, those are the ones where you send a message to others that all things are possible, all leadership roles are possible. Uh, but uh, I also face the restraints that many other people face, that we still have to have more women available, ready to serve in any role at any level in society. That's our challenge right now, to get that wave of women that nobody will say again, oh, I have a position here. That position is highly technical. That position is this. 
but I can't find any woman to do it. I say to you, no, sir. We have three or four women ready. <laughs> Excellent. You know, the environment is something that many people think that Africa has not spent a lot of time worrying about, that the issues in Africa are bigger about just feeding people, um, making sure that people get schooling. But as we kind of proceed, we're recognizing how important climate change is for Africa and recognizing that Africa has a lot to lose with respect to the whole climate change issue. Can I ask you to say a word or two about your thoughts on this topic? I think climate change is a new thing for all of us. Many of us are trying to understand the effect of climate change. We're trying to look at how we respond to these changes and they come at different levels in our society. Our planting systems are changing. You know, our seas are rising. Uh, we have fierce weather conditions. This is all new. Uh, and what we try, what we have to do, I mean, we also bear in mind that in Africa and many of the other uh, lower middle income countries, we have been the ones that have protected the environment. We are the ones that have the forest. We are the ones that have the greenery. We are the ones that, you know, I hold the carbon in, in track. But we are the ones that getting harder hit, stronger effect on us because we don't have the resources to be able to reform, to respond timely and effectively to these changing conditions. And I hope that message is getting through in all the discussions about climate change and the inequities that now exist that would have to be addressed. That's why, you know, COP26, COP27, and, you know, is supposed to now ensure that there's equity in the resources to be able to equip the rest of those countries that are already committed to continue the policies that will ensure that the environment is kept. But with that commitment must also come a commitment from the other side, that if you continue to protect the environment for the entire world, the world that has led to where we are today will ensure that they provide you with the means for you to protect yourselves from the effects. Absolutely. Well said. Well, in this particular moment, in a post-COVID world, we know that we've hit a bottom of sorts economically, livelihood, lives have been lost. Um, do you believe that it's darkest before the storm? Is this a position for Africa to take its rightful place moving forward? Or has the continent been battered so badly through COVID that it's going to continue to hurt? We're, we're trying to find some opportunities and ways that we think the, mo the continent can move forward from this place. And be curious to hear your views on what you think that looks like. Well, it's the continent of the future, by any estimation. <laughs> you know, uh, over 70% of our population are 35 years and younger. They are the dynamic force that are going to be able, now that they're getting the technical training, now that they're ready, they are going to be the ones that will be carrying the burden, you know, of, of uh, the world, as much of the world's age, Africa is young. But more than that, Africa has been taking control of its own destiny for a long time now. We have many of our countries that meet all the international standards of growth. We have many of our countries are now considered emerging economies, meaning they have already taken off. All they need to do is to continue to build upon that which they've already done, that they're sufficiently competitive. You know, we need to do more in terms of our infrastructure, is part of the biggest constraint we face, and that is limiting our work on regional cooperation and integration. 
in our work with the um, Continental Free Trade Agreement that's supposed to be a great impetus, you know, for us. For the future, I have no doubt that in this changing world, Africa will find its place and will enlarge its purpose and will take care of its own destiny using those resources and this endowment that they have long had but have not been used effectively for the good of all the African people. That's a change we dream of. That's a, that's a change will come. Well, as you talk about change, I want to give you a moment to tell us a little bit more about the great work and change that you're doing through the Amuja Initiative. Can you tell us a little bit about the initiative and what what its main what its main goals are? I committed myself after uh, ending the presidency, and I did this when I accepted the Mo Ibrahim Prize and committed you know, to use whatever I had uh, to ensure that we establish the means whereby we will promote women leadership, the ascendancy of women leadership, that we would identify those women who have already committed themselves to a leadership journey have established themselves and they have their, their dreams and their strategies all set. What they need is some mentoring, some better profiling, and they needed to create a relationship with other women who have excelled to leadership. And so Amuje identifies those who are on that journey and we have them have regular advisory mentoring service with other women who are already holding high level positions. Um, right now it's restricted to, to African countries, but the mission on that is clear, promoting women to higher ascendancy in public service and defending the rights of women and ensuring that all those obstacles that constrain women are removed and the protection of those who are subject to human rights violation because they are women and girls. I ask everybody to go to our website. I don't, I can't tell you, you know, what it is now for you to, to do it, but I think- Have it. We'll put I it up for you, madam. Boy, Teresa, you can. Um, we already have 30 women from, I believe, from 16 African countries that are already in the second year. We're now going to go to the next 15. We chose 15 because we wanted to keep the numbers small, you know, until the, until the center is well grounded and moving. But I, I mentioned the word wave, wave, and the idea is to create that wave of women holding positions, reaching back and helping others to come along so they too can ascend to higher positions of this. So, Teresa, that's it. And I'm sure you can reach out to, to um, some of our Amuche leaders. I wish you would include them in some of your programs. They would love to to tell their stories and tell you about their um, choice. Aki saw you earlier ah. this morning because we ah, yes. initiative. That is, that is one of our leaders, absolutely. Yes, well, we are very privileged to have an opportunity to speak with you today and in particular to profile the Amuje Initiative and Africa.com has recently entered into an agreement whereby we are going to be supporting the work of the Amuje Initiative. And we look forward to working with you in the years to come to continue your vision of what you've accomplished as the first woman elected president on the continent of Africa. We're privileged to have you with us and we thank you, we support you and we will continue to do so. Thank you thank and you. good evening. Fantastic. Thank you all for staying with us for so long. It's been a long, long day. 
Um, let me tell you what we have to, to wrap up. Again, we're very grateful to Madam President for, for sharing those wise words with us. Um, we have the two presidents who have foundations, Joyce Banda and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. We will be working with those organizations and uh, to bring you more programming from the activities that they do. We want to, to share their work with you, so please keep your eyes open for that coming forward. We have a fantastic film that has been um, created to introduce you to the 22 women who have served as president and prime minister. So, Deborah, over to you. Let's roll this film. It all started with the question, how many women have served as head of an African country? There's one African woman president everyone knows. I was the first woman president of an African nation. And I do believe more countries ought to try that. <laughs> but how many more are there? Two, three, four, five, or more? Well, Let's look at presidents and prime ministers since 1970. And monarchies don't count. We did the research and the actual number is... Wait, are we including women who served in the ceremonial way for just one day? No, no, that doesn't count. Okay, so the number is 22. Wow. Yes, 22. Now this number includes women who moved into the seat after the president or prime minister died or was removed from office. But if a woman had the power for at least three months, we are counting her. 22? That's a lot. Why have I never heard of all these women? That's a good question. 22 women represent 17 African countries, 10 presidents, 12 Prime Ministers, 7 are currently in office, 4 in memoriam, 2 served as both Prime Minister and President. Now, in order by length of time in office, here are the 22 women Heads of State. At number 1, Her Excellency Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, President of Liberia, from January 2006 to January 2018. I can't say I, I ever wanted to be a politician. What I wanted to do was to be a good leader. A leader motivates people, inspires them and get them to do things. A politician just talk. Be not afraid to denounce injustice, though you may be outnumbered. Be not afraid to seek peace, even if your voice may be small. Be not afraid to demand peace. At number two, the Honorable Sarah Kungongelwa Amadela, Prime Minister of Namibia, March 2015 to present. I studied economics, uh, but it's not because I studied economics that I'm Prime Minister. I could have been a teacher for economics. I could have been a worker at a bank or at a company. So you don't have to study anything specific to become a politician or a Prime Minister. You just have to empower yourself. You have to be disciplined. You have to have a vision. And, and, and then your community would entrust you with responsibilities. You don't have to be the best in class. You don't have to be the best in school or in your family. You only have to be the best that you can be. Number three, the Honorable Luisa Diaz Diogo, Prime Minister of Mozambique, August 2004 to January 2010. Our shared quest for self-reliance, equality, health, and prosperity in rural Africa will be key to building a new future for all humanity. The time when the developing world must continue to accept to have some of its citizens living in appalling conditions unworthy of human beings should be declared over. At four, Her Excellency Saleh Work Zwede, President of Ethiopia, October 2018 to present. If uh, the history of Africa was written by Africans and by women Africans, I think we would uh, find many unsung heroes. 
who are women. At number five, Her Excellency Amina Girib Fakim, President of Mauritius, June 2015 to March 2018. As an African leader who is first a scientist, I believe that in Africa is to awaken to its unfulfilled potential. Science supported by a new, more hopeful Africa Center narrative can help us propel us forward in our journey to achieving the SDGs by 2030 and eliminating the blight of poverty, hunger, and environmental degradation on the face of the continent. Our time for action is now. Great leaders sometimes fail because of the failure to listen or question the mistakes. At six, Her Excellency Catherine Samba Panza, President of Central African Republic, January 2014 to March 2016. Important qu'à cette période difficile, euh, le leader soit ouvert. Le leader ait une vision euh, de réconciliation, euh, de rassembleur. Et c'est ce que j'ai usé. Girls have to get much more interested in public matters, in international matters, and affirm themselves by making frank, open, honest commitments in the area of the protection of women's rights, in the area of politics, and in all other sectors. At number seven, Her Excellency Joyce Hilda Banda, President of Malawi, April 2012 to May 2014. I've always said that leadership is a love affair. You fall in love with the people you save and they must fall in love with you. And when such is the situation, then you will never allow yourself to do anything that is not on behalf of those that you save because you love them. The seeds of success in every nation on earth are best planted in women and children. At 8, the Honorable Maria Das Neves, Prime Minister of Sao Tome and Principe, October 2002 to September 2004. Maria Das Neves, an economist by training, campaigned under the slogan, Together for Stability and National Reconciliation. She promised to rescue what she regards as the lost soul of Sao Tome and Principe, stating that a country with no identity also has no soul. Let's find a new economic cycle that can guarantee sustainability or its development. At nine, the Honorable Mame Madio Boye, Prime Minister of Senegal, March 2001 to November 2002. It is time to act so that the name of Islam is no longer mixed with such actions on the border of humanity. No religion, no secular authority, no community must tolerate this anymore. At 10, the Honorable Rose Christiane Osaka Raponda, Prime Minister of Gabon, July 2020 to present. Gabon is resolutely committed to the transition to a more inclusive, fairer and more sustainable economy, therefore more respectful of the environment. At 11, the Honorable Victoire Tomega Dogbe, Prime Minister of Togo from September 2020 to present. The evolution of the world is indeed encouraging us to continue to stimulate innovation, technical progress, as well as technology, while at the same time further strengthening international cooperation. At 13, in memoriam, Sise Mariam Kaidama Sidibe, Prime Minister of Mali, April 2011 to March 2012. We will work on development issues in our country, an undeveloped country that needs the contribution of all its citizens, and I think that without peace, development is impossible. At 14, her Excellency Samia Suluhu Hassan, President of Tanzania, March 2021 to present. I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, I'm a wife, I'm a president, and uh, I'm the Chief on Command of the Army in Tanzania. And I have decided to take the vaccination. Some don't believe that women can be better presidents, and we are here to show them. At 15, the Honorable Aminata Tuare, Prime Minister of Senegal, 
September 2013 to July 2014. There is no place where there is so much to do in terms of infrastructure, building bridges, roads, hospitals, you name it. Um, so there is the place to, 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 to make business, uh, but you have to make it differently. It's not going to be like uh, the way we did it in the past with Africa. Those days are over, luckily. I do think access to water and sanitation is a basic human right. Let's imagine ourselves not having water for two or four days. Maybe most decision makers talking about water and sanitation should experiment with that. I think it will give them a different perspective. At 16, the Honorable Maria do Carmo Silveira, Prime Minister of Sao Tome and Principe, June 2005 to April 2006. The growing interest of countries such as South Korea in the status of observer to the community of Portuguese-speaking countries shows the economic potential of the organization without language being the central priority. At 17 in memoriam, Agate Wilingiyimana, Prime Minister and President of Rwanda, July 1993 to April 1994. There are shots. People are terrified. People are in their homes lying on the ground. We are suffering the consequences of the death of the head of state, I think. At 18, the Honorable Robina Nabanja, Prime Minister of Uganda, June 2021 to present. 10 billion, we are going to use it to buy food so that our communities that are affected can have something to eat, as we also now have uh, have uh, lasting solutions. That's all brothers and sisters. Thank you so much. Nabanja is here to make changes. Leadership is a gift from God through teamwork, transparency and accountability. Together we shall secure the future of Ugandans. At 19, the Honorable Sylvie Kanigi, Prime Minister of Burundi from July 1993 to October 1993 and president from October 1993 to February 1994. Democracy is at risk. We have to stand up. We have to accept that. It made people realize that a woman can do even more than a man can do with the soul of a mother and strong will at the highest level of politics. At 20, Her Excellency Agnes Monique Osan Belpo, President of Mauritius, March 2012 to July 2012, and again May 2015 to June 2015. It is imperative that we combine social integration and empowerment of women by providing women equal access and opportunities to contribute and benefit from the formal and informal sectors. At 21, the Honorable Najla Bowden Romdani, Prime Minister of Tunisia, October 2021 to present. I am convinced of education's ability to transform peoples and societies. This conviction is all the more deeply rooted given the catastrophic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic on education. At 22, in memoriam, Rose Francine Rogombe, President of Gabon, June 2009 to October 2009. Democracy is the sole tool that speeds up the development which mankind seeks to achieve. Thank you to all of the women who have served. Women are working for change in Africa. Women are working for change throughout the world. I will be with them and one of them forever. Well, I hope you appreciate that film. Our production team made that especially for this event. I'd like to thank 
Deborah Winter, who oversaw the production, and all of the members of the Africa.com team, Laura Joseph, Nelly, Sean, Susan, Soko. At the very end now, I must thank Coca-Cola, without whom this event would not have been possible. We thank you for your generosity, for your commitment to women's leadership and to launching the Women Heads of State Initiative. With that, it's a wrap. Thank you very much. Goodbye.